p.m. and this is the Ottawa City Commission study session. Uh, do we have any public comments? Great, thank you. Let's start with our interview for an open board seat, uh, the Accessibility Advisory Board with uh, Daniel Brown. Come on up, Daniel. Right up there, it'll be fun. Yeah. Really, wherever you sit. Yeah, yeah wherever. We'll let you sit wherever you want. Sure. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good, good. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Daniel Brown. Um, I work at Independence Incorporated. So Independence Incorporated is a relatively small nonprofit uh, that we serve as a resource center for folks with disabilities. Uh, we serve Douglas, Jefferson, and Franklin counties. So the city of Iowa is within our service area. Um, I myself have direct experience uh, serving folks with disabilities in this, within the city of Ottawa. Um, I'm also fairly knowledgeable on the ADA regulations, um, accessible standards um, of design, things like that, other issues that would be pertinent to folks with disabilities. Um, so I feel like I could serve the city well in this capacity, and I appreciate your consideration, my application. Great. Thank you. We're just going to go around the table and ask a few questions. So we'll, sure. we'll start with Commissioner Graves Kaler, since you moved down here. Yeah, sorry. Change the name. You can call me whatever you want. It doesn't matter. There you go. It's official. Um, tell me what role do you see the Accessibility Advisory Board serving um, for the City of Ottawa? Um, well, I guess just providing a perspective of folks with disabilities um, for the for the city city commission. Do you, um, in your capacity with Independent Inc., are you working with individuals on the PD waiver, or are you working in HCBS stuff, or uh, is that your all role? Kind of, not necessarily my role, but our agency does work with folks that are on the uh, use Medicaid waiver programs for folks that get in-home care tenant services in the home. So we're a payroll agent for those mm -hmm. that program, and we also provide services for folks in the work program, which is a Medicaid buy-in program. So we serve a number of folks in Franklin County on both of those programs. Primarily, what I do is like independent living skills training and advocacy services. Um, I also do some we call them like home access surveys. We'll go out to folks, uh, meet with them in their home. Um, that maybe have some accessibility issues and just kind of want to talk about what, what are kinds of things that they can do to make their home more accessible uh, for like aging in place or maybe they encountered a disability fairly recently and wanted to make their, their home wheelchair accessible, things like that. So those that's primarily what I do with some advocacy services as well. Okay, okay. Sure. With that being said, you've worked with people in Franklin County and Ottawa. What would you perceive as the biggest need concerning accessibility within Ottawa? Um, Good question. Um, we've gotten a number of requests for like housing and things like that. Um, usually what that comes down to is financial assistance to, to make modifications. Um, they're expensive. It's expensive to put a ramp on a home, um, especially if, the, if the, the door threshold is pretty high up off the ground. So that's probably one of the bigger things that we hear of. Um, it's just financial assistance to do like home modifications. Um, there's just not a lot in Franklin County to, to access. Commissioner Skibble? Getting in kind of late, sorry for the delay here. We've only done three and four. <clears throat> sorry, right, that's okay, well, I'm gonna kind of change this up a little bit. Can you tell us one of your success stories at work maybe with regard to ADA or anything like regarding what we're talking about here? Um, success stories. Um, I've helped a number of folks apply for different types of benefits. Uh, Medicaid is a big one that we get. Um, so I've helped a number of folks successfully apply for uh, Medicaid benefits. Um, right now, my agency is working with a, cons a person here within the city um, for finding affordable housing. So that was a lengthy process and we, we just recently found something for this individual. So um, that's a success story. That's that I can so. think of. Very good. Yeah. Right, thanks. Uh, Daniel, can you tell me, can you elaborate a little bit more on, I know you went kind of through, you know, the, the beginning of your, uh, telling us about yourself, but can you tell us like some more specific skills that you might bring to the, to the board? Um, sure. Um, I have been involved in doing like access surveys for businesses, I kind of mentioned um, uh, individual residences, but um, I've had a number of trainings on the ADA regulations um, and accessibility standards for design. Um, I think that's probably my primary um, skill, I guess, I would bring to this board, um, at least that I can think of. Um, we've also done a number of like advocacy issues. Um, usually it's related around applying for different types of benefits like Medicaid and Social Security disability and things, but um, probably my knowledge on the ADA is like, I guess, the number one thing I feel like I'm bringing to the board. 
Given, Commissioner, do you have any other questions for, for Daniel? I, I can do that. Yeah, Absolutely, sure. please. Do you have one? I was going to, yeah. yeah so, ahead. not being from Ottawa, what made you yeah. want to be on a board in Ottawa? Uh, yep, great question. Um, so, we serve, we serve Franklin County, um, and uh, we do our best to do outreach. I, I, I think this is, and to have some kind of a connection to the community. So, anytime we can somehow have that connection, um, and I think we saw this as a way to do that and also to provide something to the city as well. So it's a benefit, I think, for both of us. Um, we also had a former staff person who was actually on this board before me, and she changed job duties, and I actually assumed a lot of her job duties. Um, so it just kind of was a natural fit for me to apply to the open position that's because she's leaving, so. Um, how long have you been with the Dependent Sink? Uh, about 14 years. Okay. And um, my other question that I ask almost every applicant is, what's a question we should have asked you that we didn't ask you? Oh, gosh. Um, well, the, the question that I got <laughs> there about why I would want to serve the city mm -hmm. of Ottawa not being from here is probably when I was anticipating, and, and is a tough question for me to answer because I'm, I'm not from Franklin County. I don't live in Franklin County. Um, I will say I, I grew up in a relatively small town in southern Kansas, so I'm familiar with what it's like to, to live in a small town um, in, a, in a rural community. Um, but I don't know if I can think of another question. That, yeah. I got to tell you, not every, almost everybody says nothing. So the single fact that you read something is pretty, it's pretty exciting. We're waiting actually. for that yeah, one time. Exactly. Somebody's okay. like, well, actually. I'm, I'm glad sorry. you asked. Yeah. Yeah. She did ask me that six months ago, and it's scary. It <laughs> now I'm just watching <laughs> everyone. I'm like, taking notes it's if I ever have it again. So I thought I said something. I understand. Commissioners, any other questions? Daniel, thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, yeah, we you appreciate can. the application. We will uh, have a discussion later this afternoon, and uh, if anything comes out of it, we will certainly let you know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioners, that will move us on to our items to be placed on the regular City Commission agenda, <clears throat> which is our minutes from our April 25th study session, our May 2nd study session, our May 4th regular meeting, and then the proclamation recognizing May 2022 as Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, were you all able to look through all that over, and are we good to move on to the agenda? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we'll move us on to items for presentation and discussion. Uh, our first item is review of bid proposal form for Lakeside Lot Sale for consensus to proceed. Mr. Ninestead. All right, Commissioner. So you have a, a draft bid proposal form for you to review. If you really want to look at it, here in the real estate sales contracts that the city attorney has um, uh, blessed. But um, so, you just need to tell me what changes you want on the bid form. Commissioners, after looking at page 15, is there anything that you see that uh, isn't what we were talking about, or maybe we want to change now that we've had some time to think about it? Um, <clears throat> number eight uh, the impact fee being waived. Will 12 months be from the date the title, everything, all the paperwork's done, it's moved over from the date of the auction? Not that it really would matter. <coughs> well, I think it's, it might, as someone. I think is, we considered it 12 months from when the contract was accepted and finalized, right? Okay. Now, and is that, that breaking ground or working with community development? Do we have, is that defined? What beginning construction def is defined as? I, I would. I would tell you, I think the way we handled this last time is from when the contract with the city was approved, they had 12 months to start construction. Now, the reason this was in here then was because the commission as a policy decision wanted to um, give an incentive to start building on those lots instead of leaving them empty. And that's, and you need to talk about that this time if you want that incentive or if um, it is a priority for you when someone builds those that they start building within 12 months. I'm glad that. Did I answer your question? Well, in, in a roundabout way, yeah. Well, I don't, I'm not obviously legal, but I know that ambiguity I think favors somebody in that and I don't know if it's the case if we have it but I thought if it's not defined 
what considers starting construction that may leave us open that I mean it's fifteen hundred dollars. I got you. And um, I'm glad that Commissioner Clayton actually brought up um, number eight, which is the impact fee. Um, and I actually wonder if there's really a need to have that in there. Um, the last time we did this, we did this for exactly what our city manager had said. We were concerned that those lots would be purchased and then just sat on forever. I guess I'm not as worried about that now um, as I was then. Uh, certainly, I don't want them to sit empty forever um, and I don't want them to just be um, passed on for generation after generation after generation and in 50 years we see a house built on it however I just don't know that that's going to be an issue um, so I would be fine with um, omitting 18 or 18 eight sorry and then um, if if others were interested in doing so Commissioner, hmm. how you feel about that I'm, I'm starting to see mortgage rates starting to climb and I'm, I'm wondering if it things are going to start slowing down they may be similar to what it was when we did this several years ago maybe we should leave it in only reason i'm saying that it doesn't hurt anything i mean are you concerned about the, the fee income being lost or just the timing of the 12 months i just don't think it's necessary um i we didn't have this we didn't did we offset in our impact fees when we sold things from the land bank we didn't even have impact did we? No. Yeah, I mean that. So well, there were impact fees, but we didn't offset them. No, it wasn't a factor. I mean, so I guess it, I feel like we kind of about, we special, go backwards. Yeah, special assessments, not impact fees. Mm -hmm. okay. Which were paid off by the or just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. I also wonder on um, number three, the minimum bid lot. Have we? Um, did we? Did we receive some historical data on what our bid lots were from last time? The and first time that you advertised by bid for these, you did it by sealed bid and you advertised 16,000 per legal lot. 16,000 was a base. Mm -hmm. And then you didn't get what you wanted. And that's when um, your city attorney became the auctioneer. Mm -hmm. And you did a very fine job, I might add. Well, I think he ran up the prices a little. <laughs> <laughs> like I said. However, I, uh, you know, I, I think number three, um, you know, after having some discussions in the last week, I'm, I mean, quite frankly, I think we're low. Um, and I think we could raise it even more, but where we could start where we where we originally had last time at 16. Um, I don't think that really, I don't think that's really too much to be discussed, quite frankly. I mean, if you want to leave it at 15, it's perfectly fine. I think we're going to see a pretty good turnout, hopefully. Impact fee wise, um, I, I, guess, I guess my only concern with that would be, you know, since we did waive it on the last six, and I know that was kind of an incentivized, you know, some, some, some building there, um, although there was quite a bit going on at that time. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I would be okay either way, leaving it in or taking it out. Commissioner Clayton, how do you feel? I would be, same way, I'd be fine either way. I don't think it's going to be an issue in the current market. I know, like you talked about with interest rates moving, I think the number of lots we're selling, I assume the houses will pop up on them pretty fast. Um, and if not, if the market does turn crazy and they need fifteen hundred dollars, then we got sixteen thousand maybe for a lot. So I think either way, it's fine in there. Um, like you said, it's incentivizing people actually starting and not sitting on it. So I think that leaving it in there works for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think more and more. Yeah, if, it, if you leave it and if it provides to be just a little bit of the last issue of going ahead and getting it started sooner, it'll get our tax rolls sooner. I would get that help. If it made the difference, why not you know, just leave it in there? Leaving and waving it? Leaving and waving okay. it. You get a house bill on there sooner, possibly. And then that the tax benefit of the house being on there more than offset the impact fee that we're waving. I think in some ways we're giving something to kind of sweeten the pie. Uh, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, and, if, and, the, and the bid last time you say it was 16000 
So that's the that's base the time, the, on the first the, time around. Yeah, when you did I guess this. that makes no difference there, 15 or 16, one or the other. So all the bids came in above the minimum bid, right? Well, no, the no, seal, no, we're no. talking the sealed no. bid. No. When, when we're sent out for sealed bid. Yeah, yeah when you sent out 16. for sealed bids first time, the bids didn't come out at the level that you wanted them. And that's when you decided to reject all the sealed bids okay. and go with um, the, auctioneer. the auctioneer and training. Okay. So in our lap, in our packet last week, it, it indicated that what the lots are sold for. So we had two lots that were sold for 12,000, one for 14, one for 16, and then we had 21 or 20, 21, 22, 22. Um, for lots. Um, I don't, I don't need to get in the weeds about any, it's a thousand dollars difference, but um, I guess it would be different if we were giving it away for $160. We're not, or, or $150. We're not. Um, I think if we leave the impact fee in, we should just go with the base six or 16,000, just like we had done before. So 16 minimum, and then keep the impact fee wave in there. Okay. I'm so okay with that. Where do you want the 12 months to start from, from the time that in, the contract is approved between the city and the individual? When would so they pay the impact fee? Well, when they would, would the impact fee be paid? Well, normally you pay the impact fee when you go to close, um, it's collected for us. That's why I would think the closing date is a definite date. And I think that to me, the closing date would be a good one to start. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. That's so much. I agree. I think sure. that's kind of what we've done last time was closing. So does it just need to, need to change it? So it's waived if closing date is within 12 months? Yeah. Begins within 12 months of closing date. Construction begins within 12 months of closing date. Mm -hmm. But you would Whatever. probably, Whatever. yeah, that's sure. You would probably want to ask the city attorney how that was handled because he did the closings. It's in the contracts um, that it will be waived if construction is begun in 12 months because it's recorded in the land records. Because it's not released at the time of closing, it's taking it subject to the impact fee. And so, when you waive the impact fee, you file a waiver with the register of deeds to show that that assessment had been lifted. So, that's it. Uh, it shows up. If we can do it with a reimbursement, that would be easier for finance. In other words, they pay it at closing and they get reimbursed if they begin construction. Or you can do those straight instructions to be on in 12 months, get waived and removed. It's just not make it difficult. Yeah. What's and if you don't think there's a problem with the verbiage, you obviously know a lot more than I would. I just assumed that not having a specific date. Well, the, this is just going to be the bid document. You're going to have a contract that they have to enter into in order to actually take advantage of the deal. So I'm not as worried about. If your intention is that buy it, build on it within a year, you don't have to pay the, the impact fee. We can figure out the mechanics that works best for that uh, finance. I think the last one was a reimbursement. It was paid and reimbursed, I believe. We can do that. Whatever is easier from an accounting standpoint for finance, we're going to have something hanging out there. It's supposed to be an incentive, not a, not a punitive. So we'll just make it work when we can. Did we answer anything? Well, I'm not quite sure where you're at. So we leave that impact fee in there. We change three to six. Leave the wording the way it is and let the city attorney do the. Yeah. yeah. And three to 16. Three goes to 16. 16,000. Yeah. Got it. Good. Good. All right. Okay. That'll move us on to item two. Our 2023 operating budget review with Melanie Landis. Yes. I believe our first one is going to be the city commission budget. With says you. Do you mind if I open? Yeah, absolutely. Melanie's going to give you words of wisdom before Laura and I. Well, I don't know about that, but 
just to, um, I guess, kind of um, give a little framework to this process, our first conversation was last week and we talked about two of our utilities. This week is the general fund and I know that there's a lot to be talked about for the general fund, but the way that we've structured it is that um, each department would have some time with you to talk about the high points, some of their larger requests, things that are going to help their department move in the direction that they envision that moving. Um, and then uh, we'll bring back to you the detail later because we've there are some <coughs> gaps that we need to have some more information on. We won't know what that revenue stream is going to look like until we get the assessed valuation in June. Also, we need to come back um, with each of the departments and try to narrow the scope of some of those expenditures and maybe um, decide how we can creatively get as much done as we can with the dollars that are available. So. Um, they are in order in your packet um, as to what's on the agenda and um, some of those dollars are uh, the dollars associated with some of the new requests are large amounts and again we don't want you to be um, focused on that i guess necessarily right up front but your feedback is really important so if you can give everybody your feedback as to whether or not those things um, are something that you look the you know look towards the city moving in that direction or the things that you might have some ideas or suggestions on how we could do that differently or um, have questions about why they need that new position or why we need a particular piece of equipment um, any of those conversations are all really good for us to come back and, and narrow that scope for you when we come back for our next conversations so as we go if you have questions we'll answer along the way um, every department and we've tech, uh, given them a, a general basic of about five to 10 minutes per department to have a conversation with you. But obviously, if there's really good conversation, really good questions, we want that to extend as long as you need um, time available to get the answers that you have or for your questions, OK? So I guess with that, we'll get started with the city manager's department. No, the city commission's department. <laughs> city All right, thank you, commissioners. and. You want to say anything before I start? Um, good afternoon, Mayor. <laughs> That's my feel. All right. <laughs> so, you did really good. Your best effort. Yeah, so, exactly. I would be remiss if I did not tell you, and you should already know this, that it is Laura who does the work on this budget, puts it together, and this is the City Commission's budget, and make sure that you all are very well, that whatever you need to have done gets done. Okay, so here's the highlights of this. Um, for a number of years, <clears throat> uh, this body has talked about a communication specialist, but you've never said put it in the budget. So for discussion's sake, I put this in the budget for 2023. Now, it is in there as a full-time employee, but if, if this stayed through the entire budget process, there are a couple of other ways to do it, and that could be uh, part time or that could be contract, but there are some other options out there to do that. So um, that position is in here to generate discussion with you. And especially when you put it up against all the other priorities you might have in the budget globally. So um, I just thought maybe it was time to put that in there and uh, just see where you're at with that. Um, the other thing that's in this budget is um, $4,000 for new meeting room and guest chairs. If you look at our chairs, some of them have uh, been here since probably some of you were born, okay? <laughs> so even longer. But uh, you need, uh, um, I will say that the prudent thing to do when you have uh, capital investment and in furniture is that it just wears out and it needs to be upgraded. And uh, um, that needs to be done. So those are the two highlights. Did I get it right? Yes. All right. Those are the two highlights of your budget and the city manager's budget. Can you give me an example of something that the communication director or specialist would do on a typical day or, or some kind of? Well, on a typical day, they could be writing uh, news releases uh, about small things, about big things. They could be out there following the crews around, taking pictures of... Uh, of Chris as he's working underneath the vehicle and getting that out on social media 
it would probably the benefit would be is that person could pay a lot more attention to social media and working with the other media in town also to get your message out, get the city's message out. The reason I can ask that too, I'm, I've been thinking, and over the years we've been talking about trying to uh, blend with the county on some things, and uh, I just wonder if there could be a possibility. <coughs> Who's the county? Is that Casey Brady? I I asked that question once, mm -hmm. and um, um, I, uh, 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 what I asked about sharing that position, and at the time they felt that they had her involved in so many other things, and rightfully so, had her involved in so many other things that um, that just simply was not a possibility. Okay, I just wonder if there could be a half and half, or one third, two thirds, or something like that, to kind of gradually see if this is but something that we definitely need. If you're interested in that, it may be that we can go back and ask that, or if you have a, a joint meeting, maybe that's a topic of discussion between the two elected bodies. And there are, I, I would tell you, Commissioner Skidmore, at, at, as you go down the road with this, you should always be open. There are some natural fits between city and county. Right. Yep. There are some natural fits out there, and hopefully you can get to the point where you can discuss that. Um, it's not about doing away with the department or doing away with this department. It's about how do you get the greatest efficiency for the taxpayer in Franklin County. And, and, and it, I would also tell you it does not happen overnight. Um, I know of some some shifting that uh, my alma mater, Wichita State, has been involved with, and it took years to get things worked out. But um, you, you should always look for those opportunities, and those are kind of scary to all the people involved. But you just, you know, sometimes there is a better way of doing things, and there's a better way of doing things under one instead of two. And I also think, too, this communication specialist uh, could maybe well on social media lots of, lot of misinformation out there and people have their opinions about things and they're off and I don't sometimes I'm tempted to get on there and correct them and I don't and I think maybe that's a discretion is a, a good quality once in a while uh, but at the same time too if the information gets out there on, on the get-go maybe some of that misinformation wouldn't be servicing and causing so much discord about some of the there are some things to do. I want you to understand about social media, and Commissioner Clayton just went through training on this, and the training that I've received from the people who do this and other municipalities is you don't get on there and argue. You don't. You just keep moving forward with your message and getting it out there. You really don't waste the time to go back and correct most things, even though they might sound egregious. Well, and I'm not against, you know, at least, you know, being having them involved in some sort of social media where at least the, the right information could get out. It's not a matter of an argument, but maybe just a matter of uh, displaying an ordinance, just like uh, Big, Director yes. Hall did the other, yes. you know, a week or yes. so ago. That was valuable information. Yep. So, and we'll, we'll certainly discuss that down yep. the road once, you know, if we get to that point. I'll say definitely, yeah, I definitely think that there's a need because I think there's a large subset of the community who doesn't ingest news the way previous generations have ingested news as much as we hate social media that's how people get information um i, I don't get the newspaper i don't listen to kofo they're going online i heard so i might that hurts you know i, I don't have, have a radio you know I, yeah sure. but you know i have so i understand the mornings <laughs> On Monday mornings. Yeah, on Monday mornings I have a show and you don't I'll take the radio to work. I can do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, I definitely understand not understanding a lot of stuff that's going on in the city when things aren't on social media, when they're not in other modalities. If that's <clears throat> flyers coming with my utility bill, if that's things like that. So for me, and pseudo constituency of people my demographic, I guess this would be a position that I would see a lot of use. I see all of Casey's posts from Franklin County about COVID or anything that they've shared with road closures, and I think that's great. Um, so for this, I'm definitely, I see a need for continuing in the future. Like you said, it was, you know, snow clouds are coming out, letting people know what the schedule is for roads, those type of things that we see a lot of questions 
on Facebook groups and there's no one that really gives a good answer, um, then this could be a position that, you know, maybe someone just quickly links over to, here's the post from the city, here's the information you need. And so I think I see a lot of utility. And I'm certainly not against collaborating with the county to see if, you know, there's a possibility of, of you know, using Casey for some of this stuff. Um, I, my concern is she's been involved for quite some time now and her plate's probably full from the county, so. Um, I, you know, I am absolutely in favor of this position and actually I have um, pushed our city manager to um, consider this position and, and whatever you call it, I, I think I've called it 15 different things and um, but yeah, communication liaison. Um, know that there are municipalities throughout the entire state that have these individuals. Municipalities that are smaller than us, um, municipalities that are larger than us. I had a, a pretty detailed conversation with the new mayor of Topeka, well, not new, but I mean, he's relatively new, um, about um, the importance of the city telling the story and telling the correct story. And they're, I mean, they're suffering from that too in Topeka where they want to get the correct information out and how it is that they can go about doing that. Um, so I think that there's probably more um, than we realize that can be done here with this position. Um, I don't know that, um, I don't even know that, I, I, I'm not against um, working together with the county, but I don't know that we don't have enough here to do. Um, and uh, and I think we do. And I think we're responsible. We, I mean, we've got a multi-million dollar budget um, and this is, the citizen city and they should get their news how they can and the right news. Um, so I'm in favor of this position. Along with this I, in the uh, uniforms and other, is there any thought to cost of either services that they may utilize? If it's things like something like MailChimp for email blasts or something along those lines that they may want, would there be something built in? So they want to come in day one, or would that be something <laughs> net for next year? But they would come in, identify needs. I, I would refer to Paul, who handles all the email blasts, and they yeah. and they do this, and, and this is really kind of th th this person would be tied very closely to IT, if not a part of IT. Um, so I, I would refer for the Paul That's on how the blast work. Um, and then there may be some ancillary um, things like, uh, you know, we, we do buy shirts for people and that, but I don't see where there would be a substantial, uh, a substantial amount of money available. We have space in the city hall to find that space. And this person shouldn't be sitting in city hall. That's mm -hmm. what I know about it. They shouldn't be sitting in city hall. They need to be out circulating and doing that answer your question. Yeah. So, and I guess kind of with that currently, I'm assuming it's IT who does most of the social media. I know there was a Mayor Care, oh, Crowley, sorry, yeah. reading the wrong name, was in a video last year that was done. And is that stuff typically just handled within IT kind of right now? You, you have the people sitting here in this room with, that have done that. Because <laughs> I know that was something I loved. I thought that was great. That, we need to bring that cars back. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just saying. I'm just saying. I was day one. I'm not still waiting on it. Carlos. Carlos. Commissioners, any other questions on the commission budget? I don't think so. I have one thing I'd like to discuss on the commission budget. Uh, and it's not on here. Um, it's been a couple of years since we've had a discussion about our stipend. Um, combined all five of us make nine thousand dollars a year and i don't think that's representative of the time that we put in uh, to the commission so i um i'm proposing uh do we have a discussion if you'd like to if you not if not that's fine um that maybe we do an increase on our stipend to 300 a month per commissioner and uh I mean, certainly there's no other thing else involved. There's no other benefits or anything else, uh, just that increase. Um, so how does the commission feel about uh, that proposal? Well, I feel like with the, I know the county commissioners have quite a bit more than that. And, the, and we have our school board that gets uh, nothing. We are pretty voluntary. And so I often thought we should be somewhere in the middle. I don't I recommend going 
that far in the middle. Uh, I had thought of something along this line too. And I thought of more like two or two fifty a month, but uh, I think that was when was it last time we did that, Sarah? Was it been four or three years ago? Somewhere like that, we went from hundred to one hundred and fifty, right? I don't think it's out of line. Um, I think it's a it's a sticky situation to have. To, I mean, it's it's hard for us all to have this conversation. Um, but uh, I know that I've said, <laughs> and I don't necessarily have this issue now because my kids have just been raised on me being in the city commission. But when I first joined the city commission, it didn't even cover the childcare costs that I had to go to the meetings that I had. Um, and uh, if we want individuals, we can't ask people just to um, be involved and know that they we can't offset everything, but we can't <laughs> expect people just to get your blood from a turtle. We've got to be able to, and I know that that's not the right thing to say or the right way to say it. And I really need to think about this more, but I'm not against an increase. I just don't know where I'm at on that increase. <laughs> And similarly, I obviously when I ran, had no idea what the compensation was or would be. Um, I'm in a unique situation, obviously being self-employed, that this is a viable option for me. I mean, I come here from work a lot, um, but previously when I had worked in IT, this just wouldn't have been feasible. I can't, you know, and someone who has a career, your average Ottawan can't run for this office or would have a very difficult time <coughs> running for a seat at this table and fulfilling their duties and asking for almost no, you know, limited compensation. So as self-serving, it's tough, like you said, it's self-serving in the end, so it's hard, but I do think in time, it will open the door if there's some form of compensation to bringing more people to this table, potentially, um, or at least more applicants to try to sit at this table if it's something that people can do and still maintain a lifestyle. Well, and, that, and that's kind of what I was looking at. I mean, even with the increase that I had suggested, I mean, we're, we're a total of five that are even at $18,000. I mean, it's well, that's less than one county, one, commissioner. one county commissioner. Absolutely. Yes. And, and <coughs> I, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not going to entice somebody to put their name on a ballot for an extra $150. But then again, it might, you know, um, you know, we, we have that conversation or that conversation happens all the time that um, you know, change it up, new people, things like that. And I'm not saying it would, but there might be somebody that does, you know, I'll put their name on a ballot for that extra because they're the absolutely, yep. absolutely. So, um, you know, it's just opening more doors in a sense. So that's the only reason, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was thinking, you know, I, I even had this proposal. So, so at this point, I think we, should, you know, it's just part of the conversation that we need to have. I think everybody's kind of in favor. We just need to kind of narrow down a dollar figure and go from there. I think other cities our size, I mean, it seemed like we also studied them back then too, what they're being paid, and we still didn't quite get up to where many of them are being paid as well. So, right. good, good point, discussion. We're never going to be where Edgerton is. That's true. Ever. Ever. Yeah. True. <laughs> Part of our discussion that will happen gone. for sure over the next couple of months. So, the, the other thing I would tell you is when we get past this, when we get past you getting first glance at the budget, when we get into the next step, when you really see the heart of all of this, I would really encourage you that we do that all at once. You set a day aside, you set a couple of days aside, and we just get everybody in the same room and get this done. It's so funny because I think it's just we've gone through the whole cycle, at least of the yeah. time that I've been yeah. here. We've done the whole yeah. day, we've done two yeah. part days, we've done 10 small days. We've, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if there's any amazing way to do it, but certainly um, it's an option to do it one day. I think with, I, and I've, and I've, been, <laughs> I've been really pleased with what Director um, Landis has brought to the table in a new way of looking at this. And I think the way we're doing this up front, giving you your first blush this early, will help with that next step. Because not everything you're hearing it's going to stay in the budget because there's a global picture here. We have to worry about cash balances. We have to worry about revenues. We have to worry about revenue neutral spots. So 
that the next presentation will bring that all together for you with our recommendations as to what is in the final budget. So I just think, be thinking about that when we get closer, be thinking about that. I think if we can get that done in one day, one afternoon, it's a lot easier for you to draw all that together because this is your budget. There's no one else's signature on there besides the city clerks other than yours as approving the budget. And the budget is the most important policy decision that you five make about your community. So just tell us how we can help you get there. I know several years ago when we would include in a budget you know, going to League of Kansas Municipal meetings or National League meetings as well. Is that in a separate part of the budget or have we stopped attending those? Peter just there is a budget. They or, just change okay. names. There is a yeah. Yeah. That's a separate. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah, it and it's it's in here. Um <laughs> we actually left you at this is we just left you at the train at the same training levels of what you've had. Okay. All this shows you is what's me. been added to the and you've had sufficient training the last couple of years because you haven't gone anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> and hopefully that changes because you need to go. There's a couple of conferences you need to go. You need to make that trip to Washington, DC. And I say need because there's a connect between not only Topeka, but also with our representatives in Washington, DC. That answer your question? Yep, sure does. Commissioner Skidmore, thank you. Commissioners, any other questions on this budget? All right. If not, we'll move on you to the next job, Laura. Laura. Thank you for being me. Laura. Thank you for being me. I appreciate it. Just make a lot of notes in here. So uh, that'll move us on to our place and uh, the municipal court budget with uh, Chief Weingartner. Hello, Chief. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, joining me today is uh, Nicole Sloan, the Police Department Office Manager, and from the municipal court, uh, municipal court. Uh, Judge James Campbell is here to answer questions on that as well. So we'll go ahead and start with the police department budget if that's okay. And uh, presented the, men, uh, the memo with the outline uh, as requested, and as you can see from the first paragraph. Um, it is a pretty substantial increase uh, by a percentage over the prior year, 14% uh, increase. Most of that is related to increases in personnel costs. Uh, the first of five years toward funding the building repair project, which has been a topic of conversation for the last few years. And adding uh, lease payments for patrol car purchases that were approved last year that will be added to the budget over the next few years. You voted on uh, some of that financing at the last meeting regarding that purchase. So those totals will be added into outlying years for the uh, budget. And as you can see, uh, there is a very small increase in the request outside of those few items. Uh, we are not asking or planning to do any major um, technology programs, increases in personnel, increases in equipment other than those incremental that we need to keep ourselves operational. Um, fuel cost for us is always a matter. Um, as the prices again increase, we have to monitor that budget very closely. So we're, we're asking to increase the rate that we are budgeting for an outlier is, of course, I hope that the hyperinflation that we experienced over the last year doesn't continue because that makes it really tough to budget and plan for, especially with some of the supply chain issues. By the time you have budgeted, by the time you receive that, we're talking almost 18 months sometimes, and that's really difficult to try to plan for, for any department, not only the police departments. Um, our personnel costs increase are going to ask for full funding for one more year for the community policing unit. As you know, in October of last year, we were awarded a federal grant that fully funded one police officer position, one crisis co-responder, and immediately we went out and began recruiting and advertising for that. Um, I hope to share excellent news with you very soon, although I'm not prepared to do it at this meeting, but I am very confident that we're gonna be able to move forward in full capacity with the grant. Uh, that grant year runs out according to the grant outline <clears throat> this October. We're going to ask for an extension because we have yet to expend any of those grant dollars. 
So hopefully the federal government will approve that request. I don't see any reason why they would not uh, approve that, but that'll push us into farther into 2023 where those grant dollars will fund that co-responder and community police officer position. But in the off chance we don't get that approval, I couldn't in good conscience move forward with the grant without asking for a full year funding because we're asking somebody to, to potentially leave their job to come here for a one year grant without a, uh, some type of a guarantee that there will be a job for them past that. So I'm asking for one full year commitment. That's gonna give us time to evaluate the grant um, requirements to see if this is going to be a program we would like to continue in the future and go back to our partner on this, which is the Elizabeth Layton Center, to see if there was some cost sharing that we could come up with for the civilian crisis co-responder position. Then, of course, figure out if we need to keep that community police officer as part of that two-person response unit. Um, I can't see why that those positions won't be able to justify their use based on the need that's out there in the community. I think those will be really good dollars spent towards providing a service uh, that's currently, there's a gap. There's not anything out there that's gonna provide this. And as we start to talk about these other positions, and certainly we've added a position in the last few years um, that hadn't been, we are going to see ourselves over the next couple of years be in the need for a few more vehicles. And we're retaining some of the existing fleet by a structured program that we already use, but we need to make sure that vehicles are still continuing to come in. And by the time they move off of our frontline patrol into other positions, so for example, uh, the car that I drive was a former frontline uh, police vehicle that spent two years on patrol work. And it's the same way for every other command staff member and detective who has a take home vehicle for response. Uh, we don't generally buy new cars for those positions. The only new cars we buy, we give to the patrol officers because they're the folks that need it the most. They need to have the most reliable equipment and the safest equipment that we can provide for them to be out there serving that uh, patrol function. Um, supply and demand is a big issue right now in the used cars or even in the new cars. Um, we, like I explained in the uh, presentation that Melanie did, we got really lucky that our vendor that we use actually had vehicles on the ground in Wichita waiting for us. That's probably not going to happen this year. So next year when we go out, I'm not exactly sure what to expect. Um, but the request for capital purchases is for two vehicles and then take advantage of the Kansas Highway Patrol Fleet Program where they have some really good cars with fairly low miles at a very reasonable price, already completely outfitted with emergency equipment. So we can purchase one of those used vehicles for them and assign that to a staff or detective member and uh, looking to replace two of those. And we use a benchmark of, uh, of either age or mileage or age and mileage, depending on when those vehicles roll out of their fleet. Um, two cars that we just sold at a purple wave auction that closed on April 26th. Uh, sold for substantially more than I expected them to draw, and the total between the two vehicles was over $20,000. Um, that's pretty good. I can't say we expect to see that every single time we go out to Purple Wave, but right now, the way that the used mar uh, car market is, we're probably going to see those. Next is our capital project, and that is the repairs to the law enforcement center. The building was built and uh, occupied in 2003, constructed a few years before that. But since that building's been built, we've had recurring water issues, water coming in from the roof, the walls, and certainly in the flood of 2019 uh, from the ground up. We've been trying to repair damage related to that. It got to a point where we needed the experts to come in and give us a look at that, which we did. So we had a engineering firm come in do a complete look at the building and what they would recommend on those repair costs. I provided that documentation uh, to city staff and the discussion now needs to begin of if and how and when we want to fund that. And I know the city manager just talked a little about that, so I won't get ahead of him or his conversations on that. But to be prepared if we decide to fund that, we've asked for um, one, one year's worth of funding towards a five year project completion goal. So the manufacturer in the report outlined how, what would it take if the city decided to fund that project over five years, factoring in 
uh, inflation, cost of goods and material increases, and that would be just about $115,000, $16,000 uh, each year until they got to the overall project cost for that to be completed. I hope that if we were able to go out and do a larger finance package, those rates are still going to be good, although each day we seem to hear that those rates are not quite as good as they have been. And that could definitely affect long term key decisions they get made on that. I provided uh, in the packet the worksheets that kind of explain the co responder, the community police officer positions, and what those related financial impacts could be. In addition, uh, the financial impacts for the police fleet vehicles, and then the project for the law enforcement exterior, uh, what's called the master st stabilization and rehabilitation plan. And with that, I'd stand for any questions that you have for the police department. I'm, I'm looking at the cost again for that uh, community police officer. So at the top of this one second page, it says 73-1 without benefits. I'm just curious why without benefits, but we add them down here in a different category. We Yeah, so that box that's for calculating benefits was after we completed the first draft, and those dollar figures come right out of our grant application, so we had to break it out by salary and benefits oh, for, the, for the grantors. Uh, so we broke, just kept that same language consistent from the grant to the request. Okay, and the 60390 on the first page, that's for something else. That's right, that's a crisis code response. <coughs> different position? That is a different position. Okay. That is the civilian that will be hired. <coughs> Technically, it's going to be an ELC employee that we're contracting for that service. Okay. They're not on the second page because they're out of a different. They're not our employees, so it wouldn't be our personnel. It's going to be a contract. Yes, so a separate contract. Yeah. Okay. They will have benefits. It's just that benefits will not be um, paid for out of the city budget. That is correct. Yes. Okay. There. So on the on the team, um, and I, you know, I'm so excited about this particular initiative, and I know that um, Chief Weingartner and I have talked about this position um, with the co-responder, the crisis co-responder, for a couple of years now, at a minimum. Um, <clears throat> so the community or community police officer and the crisis co-responder will work together as a team. Will the co-responder work with others? Or they are to go there. They will work. Team. They will work as a team. And right now, our intent is to have them work together each day to accomplish that crisis mission. So, as calls come in that are not um, uh, uh, violent or where danger is really going to be a primary concern, the co-responder and the community police officer will respond as a team and handle those calls together. The dip, the addition, the work of the community police officer, separate from what the co-responder will do, is some of those other underserved communities that we've um, had uh, some issues with providing necessary services, homeless, um, neighborhood disputes, safety and training programs that we get requests for that they're going to be able to give related to that mental health. So, um, and this may be a, a bigger question for another time, but there's a there's a large discrepancy in their salary. And if they're going together, <clears throat> is that a conversation we should have at another time? Or? Well, the, the officer that's currently filling the need is an experienced police officer. So the current officer has almost seven years of experience here. And you'd be hiring an experienced individual who has experience in the mental health field, correct? I mean, the, education and experience. They do have that, and yes. The, yeah based on the recommendations from, from ELC compared to what they're paying their employees of similar qualifications, this position actually it's exceeds some of that. We did that intentionally to try to recruit the best qualified people that we could. I know you had mentioned in there kind of how obviously this is such a huge need. Will they be doing any other work in terms of training or other stuff with your staff, standard, you know, officers in terms of handling situations maybe before they get there, or is there anything built in with that? Is that would that be in their job duties that they're like also training people as well and communicating that stuff? Yeah, in fact, as part of the grant requirements that we wrote in there was to provide that training both internally and externally. So the interdepartmental training, and then as they 
kind of learn and understand their role, having those opportunities to provide some of that training to the public as well. Okay. Yeah. And as a, a CLIA accredited agency, actually, we have to provide mental health training to all employees, not just sworn, but all police department employees. Mm -hmm. So okay. we are already doing that too. Mm -hmm. Chief, do you have six detective cars? <laughs> Uh, the reason I'm asking because it says currently all one detective yes. car exceeds department's fleet mileage benchmarks for replacement, but then it kind of contradicts itself with the next statement that says there are currently four of the six detective fleet cars that exceed the benchmarks. Yeah, where I said all but one, I don't know why I missed that. That's not right. But yes, uh, four of the six cars exceed those benchmarks okay. of either 10, 10 mile years or, or 100,000 miles. And you're looking at replacing two of the four? Yes. Okay. And only because, it, you know, you, like you say, you're exceeding the mileage, which is probably why the, two, well, sorry, two <laughs> were sold because it, it exceeds the benchmark, different vehicles, but that's why they were sold, correct? They were sold as part of our normal kind of fleet management okay. program where we bring two in at the end of their useful life, no matter what that is, we always try to remove two from the fleet so we can kind of maintain that similar number. The problem is we've added a few people in there, but we need to keep some of those vehicles for uh, the, over the next few years that we might otherwise sell so that we can continue to have enough working vehicles for all of the people. Have you purchased used vehicles for the detectives before like this? Uh, they we've purchased so yes we have purchased three from KHP two went to command staff one went detectives um, about ten years ago okay. and those vehicles actually are <coughs> still, still in the still fleet, fleet. so we got a pretty good return on that we did good that was my concern I mean they always say that the used vehicles especially probably in your uh, field um, they're probably uh, uh, yeah. I trust well loved. Well, yeah, loved. well loved for I, sure. I trust the Kansas Highway Patrol's fleet maintenance program just as much as I trust Chris and his staffs, and they do Good. a tremendous job. Good. So <laughs> we wouldn't entertain those if they weren't. But they've Good. been they've been reliable. Good. Thank you. Years ago, um, Chief, and this was years ago. Um, did our detectives utilize seized vehicles and vehicles that had been? Uh, we've we probably had one. Yeah, we've had one seized vehicle that I can recall being used by the department from a drug investigation. Sure. Okay. And it was assigned to the drug detective. But it, uh, as a uh, normal matter, no, That's we don't. Just, just making sure. Yeah. Maybe still for time for You mentioned the basement of the police department, so the water's coming up, up underneath, not cracked from the walls. Is that correct? It's coming everywhere. It's coming At least there. when you have a thousand year flood. <clears throat> and okay. a lot of the damage that was done to the basement that has been repaired was from that August 2019 flood. Yeah. The, uh, mo the majority of the other damage continues to come through the ceiling, the roof, the gutters, the downspouts, um, <clears throat> some of the cracks and seams in the exterior foundation that really needs some attention. Okay. Might be a good location for a new pool, maybe instead of mm -hmm. uh, plenty of water. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty of water. <laughs> and indoor, too. We can do an indoor pool. <laughs> Look at you being resourceful. Commissioners, okay. <clears throat> any other questions for Chief Weingartner? Or Nicole? Mm -hmm. No. Or Judge Campbell? Nicole, are there any questions that we should have asked you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any right now. <laughs> so do you want to cover the court uh, specifically yeah. for a few minutes? Yeah. 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 Nice, Judge. Can you come up if you wouldn't mind? Oh. You're welcome to stay back there, so it's your choice, sir. Oh. Well, there's no there. oh, Come on. <laughs> you know I don't bite. <laughs> Just to kind of provide some context in case people don't know, the Ottawa Municipal Court employs a full-time and part-time court clerk, a city prosecutor, and a municipal judge. Uh, we hold court, case, court every Wednesday, and that hears all of the cases that are heard in municipal court from first appearances to trials, uh, including some of the nuisance docket for citations that come over from the Community Development Department as well. Um, the overall budgeting uh, budget request for um, 2023 is actually a decrease 
And that's related to completion of several years worth of projects to upgrade technology devices in the municipal core. So we have completed those projects. We are waiting for some supplies to continue to come in uh, from 2021 and the 2022 projects. We hope to have both of those projects wrapped up by the end of this year. And according to our vendor, that should occur. And then we've left sufficient funds in there, even though it is a reduction, to replace a few more of those electronic devices. And that's really gonna help us out over the next few years because why we had to replace these in this manner is we bought all of these uh, devices at once. The company that runs them uh, provided a warranty. We were able to extend that warranty or buy additional years of that. However, those devices are no longer supported because of the technology advancements that have occurred. So we can't get them repaired. We can't buy maintenance. So we have to buy new devices. So now we're gonna implement kind of a rolling stock program so that we don't have to do this in such bulk in the future. <clears throat> And other than that, there's really no additional uh, request for that, but I'd like to give Judge Campbell an opportunity to address the commission if he wants to. You heard the numbers going down. <laughs> yeah. You're doing a, great, doing a great job. <laughs> I don't know, are there any questions you guys have about any? This will be, July 1 will be my 24th year here. So. It's been the happiest 24 years of your life, isn't it? It's not Go bad. It's not. Um, I, I will say this, of, of all the things I do, this is, and you, you guys were going through this, this is far and away where I make the least amount of money. But the reason I do it is because it's half a day a week, I get to make decisions as opposed to have all my decisions questioned by the judges. and. I think we do a pretty good job. And I will give some kudos to the judge and the court staff that through COVID-19 and the pandemic required them to uh, come up with some pretty unique ways to respond to that while still continuing to deliver justice. And they did a great job at that and got us back operating safely. The court is open to the public. So I mean, if absolutely work. somebody were to come and want to watch oh, you in action, absolutely. we could do so, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we actually, <laughs> we were considerably more efficient during the pandemic than a lot of places so that we did not have nearly the backlog and the problems that a lot of, uh, places experienced because we started very early in March of 19, um, with Chief Wine Gardner and Nicole and with Mark and with our clerks. We said, you know, we need to start planning for some things. We need to start doing some things, but you can't just kick everything down the road. We've got to start making meaningful progress. And we were able to do that so that when we came out of it, we were in much better shape than a lot of places. So, yeah, we're really awfully close to being pre COVID operations right now. So. Is that a, the defense attorney budget? Is that for public defenders? It is. For, okay. It, and again, that's a little bit of a, a misnomer in the fact that some portion of that is recovered, but everything comes back in, whether it's fines, costs, fees, or whatever it comes in. And then we deposit it back into the general fund of the city. So part of that gets actually reimbursed. We don't specifically track it, but part of it comes back. And those defense attorneys are on appointment list, so there's multiple of our um, appointed attorneys that handle that duty. Commissioners, any other questions? All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. That'll move us on to human resources and employee benefits with Michelle Watt. Another decrease, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. I will let you go in and I'll flip behind you. No Thank problem. you. Hello, Michelle. Hello. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Okay. All right. Well, the HR budget um, is uh, the HR department is responsible for HR systems, processes, technology, and other uh, programs for our organization. 
and um, the overall increase uh, from the 2022 budget is $51,225. A majority, uh, let me back up and say this, um, the HR budget pays a, a portion of compensation, the salary of three HR staff employees. And we just recently backfilled a position that had been open for a number of years, the HR receptionist. And that was in early April. I'm very excited about to have three staff members on board at this point. Um, so the overall increase that we have um, is majority is um, actually related to a capital expense a compensation study. Uh, we have not done a compensation study since I think they began that project previously. My predecessor did that with city staff in 2013, did more work on it in 14. In April 1st of 2015 is when um, they rolled out new pay ranges and they made some other um, changes to compensation for all employees. And um, what I have in my memo is 50,000. I, I think that number may, may change or get tweaked a little bit. Um, that is out of the general fund. The total amount for that project, and I'm kind of skipping around a little bit, um, is um, 80,000. That's what we estimate. Um, we talked a little bit about this um, when I presented the budget. Um, for 2022, I just it was just a blurb in my in my budget memo, just for you to start thinking about it. Um, but um, the rest of that um, would be split between the enterprise funds. We um, so what we've been doing the uh, we worked with CBiz previously and still have. Um, what we did every year is they did an adjustment of our pay ranges. Um, they adjusted the min, the midpoint, and the max. And in 19, we did make those changes. Um, um, I think the last time we adjusted the pay ranges was 19. They've had they've remained the same. We typically never hire someone someone at the bottom of the range. Um, we do have some employees that are maxed out. A number and I can't give you a specific number, but there are some. Um, and so, do you have any before I talk about the, the um, capital request for pay study? Do you have any questions about the HR budget? Yeah, I guess in the, in the compensation study, I don't remember what the, what the last one cost was it about 40,000? I don't remember, it's like a lot of money. I'd have to go back and look. I, I can was drill it down. It was in it was in thirteen uh, is when they started and more work it, it may have been tabled but more work was done in fourteen and then mm -hmm. finalized April April first. I, I can go what? back. I, it might have been around. Well, I don't want to quote it, but it was less than eighty thousand. Yeah, I remember that part. I, I was trying to think too uh, on on what came before the study. Where we discovered that a lot of people were leaving us for salary inequality, and that prompted us to do the CBiz study. And I don't know, it's the same thing going on now. Are we having some higher turnover than normal? I don't know if Richard recalls. Well, uh, it, it came about because we had not done a study for years. Um, and we were experiencing recruiting issues in a couple, in a number of areas, some which we still experience recruiting issues, mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, well, yes, it came about because there were some recruiting issues at the time. So we did that study to try and uh, make sure that we were at least competitive in the market. Mm -hmm. And it did mean, I, I think if I recall, it did mean that we did make some significant you did, adjustments. You did, mm -hmm. you made about Which, a half a million dollars worth of adjustments over the course of two years <clears throat> in employee salaries. It looks yeah. like that in January 2013, we, we partnered with Franklin County to do a city study or a joint study. Well, 
that no that uh, this is what that that was a discussion I, that, yeah that was a discussion a we did that came, but we chose yeah. different vendors yeah. right and then it says that on here that the city study was thirty thousand dollars thirty thousand two fifty it was considerably less than what we're looking at which I mean it was ten years ago mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know it, it seems our geographical location is great and in other sense it's also a disadvantage to us we can train a police officer here for two years and they go to over the park and make a lot more money we spend all the money training and then they leave us right and so i guess part of that is trying to understand how to uh, you know justify a virtual eighty thousand thing well we spend a lot of money raising the salaries of the people that maybe they won't leave us uh, therefore reduce the turnover but at the same time it's an imperfect study to action i guess to, to do that uh, yeah i'm just kind of looking at the sticker shock i guess that's where i'm right. kind of wow how many employees does the city have total oh 170 ish i mean there's you know we have part-time we have a handful of part-time mm -hmm. employees regular full-time and sometimes these studies recommend actually identify positions that the, according to the market were paying too high for huh? so they can pay yep. them so we also have seasonals mm -hmm. during the growing yeah, season. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Similarly, just like you were saying, like seeing eighty thousand dollars for one hundred and seventy people is a sticker shock for money that could be going to those people. Like you said, and maybe not, but like you said, if we're trying to retain people. I, I, from personal experience, I left the county to go to Cerner because of financial reasons. So I understand. The employee's perspective in retention and i remember that wage study and it got me a quarter and so yeah that's what's yeah tough trying to like you said the sticker shock of right uh, so and i want you to remember bit. we made over the course of two years because of this study the commission authorized over half yes. a million dollars of adjustments all that almost all employees were were touched by that the value of having the third party come in and do this is that there is a logical premise, market-based premise, that they are able to provide you with a report that says, look, here's where you're above the market, here's where you're below the market, and here's what you ought to do. And it's best, best, best practice, best practice to have an expert a compensation expert evaluate you know not only our our market here but other local governments um, and, and and there are some positions we may never ever be able to be competitive in in the sense uh, one, one of, some of those are some of uh, uh, Dennis's uh, director Tharp's positions in uh, electric okay. especially electric uh, linemen mm -hmm. what we don't come close to competing with private what private enterprise can offer but on the other side we offer some good benefits and i and i would venture to say a better working environment than if you're out there uh, working with the private and i suppose there's some benefits to utilizing cb as the same company if we did this again rather than put out for bids for another company for <clears throat> getting a better price we, we would probably i i did get an, an amount previously from them but i probably would issue an rfp i think that's the probably okay, that's the, the best thing to do um, so I know there's are, others uh, there other, are different ways of doing yeah. this if you decide that that stays in the budget it may be that we don't have to do a full city study. We may just pick out the areas that are continuing to be a challenge. Right. Out there. And that's, that's, I've seen that done before. Be interesting to see that result. Yeah, see what that would cost. We, um, we, um, our turnover for 2021 was 10.3%. Yeah, and so that, yeah. that equated to about tw 21 employees and a portion of those were some of our firefighter volunteers that, that went on. But there's a lot of costs associated with and, and there are reasons for turnover, not necessarily yeah. going for another job. Right. Yeah, that, there are and, some other reasons that aren't necessarily voluntary. Right. Does the study 
Is it a full analysis of not just other municipalities, but also the market in general? Yes. So like you said, alignment, here's what they're making here. Here's what they might make. So at least that's obviously we can't match that, yeah. but that we understand that people may be going to those other agencies. Yes, I would assume that would be, be part of it. Because I mean, it, we, it we most know assuredly was last time that there was a comparison between those positions we know that you can go to the private side mm -hmm. and not only the public side. And there was a there was a lot of time, there's a lot of work spent um, looking at the job description um, forms, uh, making sure that we have people doing what they're supposed to be doing so that can match up what's over in the private enterprise mm -hmm. side also. And information is money, so it makes sense. That and there are, quite frankly, that there, there is a ceiling to every job. Mm -hmm. These studies and analysis are always difficult pills for me to swallow, because I agree. That's a, that's a pretty big chunk to pay out to get a study that I think the folks that we hire for those department heads could probably figure out themselves. I mean, the study said that, you know, in 13 that, you know, we were underpaying and came back and raised it. Uh, I don't think that that couldn't have been a conversation that was had, can be had, and we could make our own analysis. So that's uh, I, it's a... I, no, go ahead. No, please. I, I can appreciate that, but um, it's an extensive um, analysis. Um, I know that there are um, some local government, smaller local governments that send out, I get email blasts from every HR professional for local government almost every day asking for um, how much is this position? You know, what what do you pay for this position? They don't they don't send a job description. We don't know if it's a like position, but it's it is it is an extensive um, a lot of time is spent to to do that analysis. Um, I work for a, a, another employer for eight and a half years. We actually hired um, a. a compensation consultant and um, we we did a similar type of um, situation and used a different vendor but it was it was a lot of work and it was not only um, on the on the beginning of the project the middle of the project the rollout of the project and then doing it again in 2014 2015 before I came here we redid it we did another um, evaluation but I, mean, I, I can completely understand what you're saying there, but it's um, well, best yeah. practice. Thank you. And I, uh, this idea of pinpointing more specific departments that are having issues to maybe just do those. If it's not broke, don't fix it. If it's working, everything's fine in this department. It seems uh, like we don't need to spend the money to enhance this if it's working. But if we have a department that has a higher turnover, you say we kind of compartmentalize the study. In that way? That's a that's a possibility. Maybe that's an avenue cost. that some some do. Okay. I'd, I'd be interested what the cost savings is though, because yeah. I bet it's not half. I bet it's not. They just make it a third, because we're only going through a third of our. I mean, there still is a basement cost. I mean, just a foundational cost for it. I mean, I don't think it's a bad idea to have, but something. I think we also need to look at that. If this is something that we um, are looking to put into the budget, remember that it's it may be a one year cost, but we actually get benefit for it for years to be. I mean, we did this in 2013 and we're talking 10 years later. So we spent $30,000, but if you break it out into tens, $3,000 a year. And if we retain more employees, there's really return on investment for that. If we retained an employee or two or three employees because we did make a wage change and we did true up our wages, then there's return on investment because there's less things that then Michelle has to do about trying to advertise for jobs and look for jobs and interview people and train people. And there's a cost to have new employees come in and out, a tremendous cost that comes 
at every taxpayer's feet when a new employee comes in. So, do you know if our turnover um, rate percentage is higher, lower, comparable to surrounding cities, um, similar size? I just participated in a survey. Uh, the, the, um, League of Kansas Municipalities, I'd have to go and look and see if that was something that was a part of that survey. Okay. I got those results, but I don't have access to them. Right yeah, I'd be interested to hear. Sure. You know, yes. you know. um, they also do yeah. limited wage studies, but I mean, as Michelle said, I mean, it's not apples to apples. We don't sure. know that mm -hmm. this, this service technician's job duties are for City yeah. A yeah. are the mm -hmm. same jobs activities and same job duties for city b right just because they have the same name and we probably ought to look at that the league when we send out rfps the league does do <coughs> salary studies i've had them do a couple over the last 42 years right. and well yeah they do and i do have those results i just got them a couple weeks ago but you know we do i you know we the other thing we need to do is change the, the min and the midpoint and the max that's the other recommendation and that's something I can so i had that. it in there last year but i redlined it last year mm -hmm. um, this is just in here for discussion purposes i don't i don't from from my level i don't know if i'm going to recommend to you in the end that we do do it but it's here for your discussion Yeah, similarly, I think it's a really good thing to do. I think I was more shocked kind of like you'd said about the amount. Um, but I think it's a very good thing that we need to do to be competitive and remain competitive. And I think we're not the only ones facing staffing issues. So this could help that. Right. And, and the other thing I wanted to add is if, if we, if it did transpire in 2023, if they had any recommendations, much like CBiz did, that we implemented over a course of two years, that would be um, reflected in the 2024 budget if the commission adopted those recommendations. Well, at the earliest. Right. Because the last time we did this, it took, I would say, 18 months. Do you remember, Dennis? I would, Adam, it took close to 18 months to get from start to finish. Almost as long as it takes to do the budget. Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> the what? I said almost as long as it takes to do the budget. <laughs> and I can make some additional calls to some potential vendors to see, you know, to get some additional quotes or just ask questions if you if you would like me to do that. It has to be done yeah. at some point, yeah. because no matter what we <clears throat> think in our gut about what's going on out there, this is a more sophisticated workforce. Our workforce is part of that. Um, and they pay attention to this. And what you have working against you is also the thing that works for you, and that's being in the metropolitan area, especially when, when it comes to um, linemen, or it comes to public safety officers. I remember having a heartache about it when we did this in 2013 and thinking that that was a, you know, done your person's salary and um, this again, is, I mean, the salary, but that like attention of employees, right? Yeah. Not a you know, commissioner salary. <laughs> I kind of like the idea if you pinpoint that, however that, what do you call that when they look at just different departments as to the whole thing? I don't know. If we, and I don't know how we can determine which departments we know, which ones have higher turnovers, but to me, if we can <coughs> get it more in detail down to. Well, it it, it that, becomes a subjective. It becomes subjective on our part. I mean, to to decide at, which departments would yeah, be. Yeah, like and, and uh, where I'm at with most of this is. I look at where we have the most difficult time in recruiting. Okay. Now, the most difficult and the most difficult recruitment positions at my level have been 
the community development director and the director of finance in the last couple of years. That's true. And, and it's I, not, not, and it wasn't necessarily because of the salary that we offered. Anyway. And I, I see in that almost being more detrimental to those employees to be saying, <clears throat> you guys are fine. Maybe you're not making yeah. bills at home and you're upset, but you're fine. Yeah. We're looking over here. Right. At least if it's global, we're understanding that all of these people go home and have lives. I feel like if we're subjective to certain departments, we're saying to those departments who didn't get picked for a wage study that yeah. what they make and take home for their families right now is how I would yeah. see it if I were that employee sitting in a chair. And the last time we did this to that point, internally, most of the discussion there was there was considerable discussions about several departments. It wasn't necessarily all true. But yeah, let's remember Commissioner Ramsey has commented about this. I came visit a few commission meetings before I got on and this was quite a contentious discussion, I recall. But I it was a contentious yeah. discussion. But yeah. <clears throat> Do you have, you got more? Oh. I have the are you, yeah. do you have any other questions no. about the any, HR budget? Any more on HR <clears throat> commissioners? No. Okay. Okay. The employee benefits uh, fund is a division within the general fund and it is uh, primarily, it is used to pay for the expenses for every employee in the general fund. And uh, the overall increase of this budget is 89,900, 89,900. Um, each year when we, when we um, go through this budget process, I reach out to um, all the, our broker hub internationals, our benefit broker, and they, um, uh, after communicating with them and kind of looking at claims usage, um, which is, is this year is uh, what I've seen is last year and on into this year is significantly higher than it has been. But we we uh, included a 10% increase to the health insurance um, line item and 6% respectively to dental and vision. And um, I'll, I also conferred with CAPERS where I looked at uh, they have a contribution percentage that the city has to uh, contribute to both CAPERS and KPNF uh, employees. And so we've we updated those and uh, made changes um, to payroll taxes. And I work, work with fi the finance department and they run all of the, they do the analysis on what an employee might be enrolled in um, for their benefits or in those vacant positions they budget for those accordingly now um they they had been but they're budgeted budgeting let's say worst case scenario um as far as expenses so that the, that it's it's available there if we hire somebody whether they enroll in a single policy or a family policy and um i think what else i could share with you um, and we also are also budgeting for, um, and we did, we started this last year, we're budgeting for retirement, potential vacation and sick leave payouts um, for 23. So that's a part of this budget. Um, and let's see. And we've had an increase um, in employees utilizing our flexible spending um, uh, benefit where, where employees can take pre-tax pre dollars and uh, set aside funds and purchase prescriptions, you know, pay, pay for deductibles. And we've had an increase in employees participating in that program. So there's some, there was an increase in that. The employer pays the administration costs. We switched to a new carrier called PNA Group. Um, this, for this calendar year. So we pay the administration costs, but we are not contributing anything. No, 
We do fiscally we, to the not not into that, but the city does contribute to the HSA okay. plan. Uh, we don't not to the FSA. Not to the FSA. Um, and the yes, that's correct. I'm assuming that the 10% and 6% increases are just costs that the city is incurring for those. Those would be the premiums. Increasing. Increasing right. the premium. Right. <clears throat> and is that essentially would that keep their premiums that they are paying? Is that supposed to almost offset instead of pushing some of that to them to keep their the amounts that they're currently paying closer to the same and we're kind of absorbing the difference well last year um we had a very good renewal year and um we the the overage i'm, I'm just going to share this um we had an overage any any additional amount that we budgeted went into the um what is that fund? Um, health, the, the health insurance fund. health insurance fund that we have set aside in the event that there's some kind of catastrophic claims, um, we, or our claims expense for the, the for the year goes beyond what what we anticipated. And you might talk about just what the city what what the city sure what the, the employer employee right. breakdown is on the health insurance. Sure, we changed this a couple of years ago, so. For the premium that the employee pays, um, the, the employee pays 25% of the cost of the premium, whether it be single, employee spouse, employee child, or family, and the city on all policies picks up 75% of the cost of the coverage. <clears throat> the, other, the other piece to that we do have a wellness program where an employee, if they participate in a wellness program, um, they um, the city will pay for their labs, you know, the um, health assessment, and um, then they have some additional things they have to do. They have to watch, participate in, um, uh, watch wellness videos throughout the year, and if they do that, they get a discount on their on their premium as well. And the city pays for the labs um, uh, with the current wellness vendor, and um, so there's some save additional savings for them. And you know we encourage the wellness. We have a significant number of people that are enrolled in the wellness program. <clears throat> And I think this ties to the previous discussion, obviously, that it is a great benefit that we pay, you know, that large portion of insurance. Right. Um, and I think that is something that helps draw and keep employees mm -hmm. because state insurance and stuff is municipal insurance is usually pretty good. Um, and we are self insured and we're really pretty healthy now. A lot of that is because of. of uh, Michelle's management and working with our consultants, um, we go through a pretty detailed process every year on those benefits out there. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it's a good benefit. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's very competitive. And yeah, we should have brought that up earlier when you were out there. <laughs> Commissioners, any other questions for Michelle? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe we continue on a short break. Good. <laughs> you want to take a five minute break? Right. Yes, Let's do it. Let's get to work on midnight. That's what we're doing. Five yeah. minute break. Let's do it. Five. Hey, I brought the ten. Too. We just I mean, jumped in. <laughs> how long do you want to go tonight? I'm going to end up getting my hand sanitizer here. It's one moment. I'm like, is yes. that edible? Call them and see what it's like. No, I tried it. It's really oh, darn good. Okay. I'm like, oh, it's really good, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I've never been given a code. Like 12 years, I've never been given a code. No. So the rest of you get two minutes apiece. <laughs> Got it? I'm I think that's what we're playing. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give them time and I'll just go. Yeah. That's one of those. Uh, Five, one and a half. I told her I could probably do mine on break. Yeah, right? Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I know, I know, right? We talked about it. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm to do that. I'm going to do that. Yeah, every day. I don't think that's happening. No, he's a I can't let her off the leash. Yeah. She's smart. She's smart. Yeah. She uh, yeah. she doesn't act Don't we all? Yeah.
Our next uh, our next item is going to be the public works uh, department with Dennis. I believe you got a special guest too. Absolutely. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Commissioners, we'll start. You did. You did. Well, and I guess I I should say good afternoon to to everyone. Almost evening. Although, yeah, we're almost into the evening. Uh, you know, quiet, quiet, quiet. Yeah, One yeah. of the, the things that I'll point out, and, and you all have already seen it, I don't uh, I don't know that I really have to point it out, but a lot of the increases uh, that you're seeing are, are just related to what's going on in, in the world we live in today. Uh, the costs of everything have gone up to you all, and when they go up to you all, everything that we do, the costs go up. Uh, what we will do uh, is... Uh, my cohort here will introduce himself. He'll uh, uh, talk about uh, what, what we do. Uh, we'll start with parks and uh, then move to cemeteries. And what you're going to see is that uh, most, well, nearly all of the changes are related to two things. First of all, what I just talked about, costs are going up. Uh, I don't see anything going down these days. And the second thing is vehicles and equipment. Uh, we've had this conversation. Uh, vehicles are expensive. One, two, we can't get them. You know, uh, so if you know those two things tied together make it extremely difficult. Uh, so we're some of the places that we're asking for things are vehicles that we're trying to buy this year that we're almost sure that we're not going to see this year. Um, then. Just as an example, and this has nothing to do with parks, but I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, I was told today that if we order a bucket truck now, we'll see it in 2026. Really you know, so, so that's the kinds of things that we're trying to budget for here today. It's nearly impossible. But we've got to try to keep these things moving forward so that we are replacing some things that are that we just simply haven't done for for a long period of time that said real real quick guys on that note about the delay and broadly speaking is it better for us to just wait on some of those because for a couple reasons i think if we wait maybe that the costs come down on some of those uh more readily available costs come down and you know it's, there's less burden on the city that's that's one approach I, you know, I, I, we could probably sit here and debate that all afternoon. I don't know that either one of us gains anything by doing that, but uh, there are several schools of thought to that end, you know, and, and that is one approach. I would also venture to say that if we if, if we can't get it, if we, if we budget for it, and at the end of the year, if Melanie can make that transfer over into the equipment reserve fund, then you at least have your you at least have that allocation there. Hopefully that's drawing interest, but you at least have money put away for that 2026 expenditure so you don't get hit with it all like that. And coupled to that would be so that the area of bucket trucks we'd see you know you're what four years out, I guess, I don't know, what three years out. But for something like mowers, are you having the same issue with uh, mowers? It depends on the equipment. It okay. absolutely depends on the equipment. Some of the mowers, and I'll just let DJ talk yeah. to that. Yeah. So okay. I'm DJ Wells, Parks and Cemetery Superintendent. Um, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm here to um, propose both the parks and cemeteries budgets, but we'll start on parks. Um, so the Park Department strives to provide a, clean, a safe, clean, and welcoming area for all of our community to enjoy a better way of life. Um, the Parks Department in 2023 is proposing, uh, requesting a budget increase in total of $134,625. Um, we'll go through some of this, uh, the larger numbers with that, um, but mostly that in cases capital equipment um, for the vehicles, kind of like what Dennis was talking about. Um, some of that is added in for contractual services um, from us moving into a new parks building and a little bit of outsourced labor. Um, as everybody knows, every time they go to the gas pump, um, fuel prices have increased. 
So we raised that budget some. Um, it was a little bit extra in the parks budget um, because we have combined the crews of the parks and the cemetery. So now both of those crews maintain both the parks and the cemeteries. So the fuel budget was decreased a little bit out of the cemetery budget. So we essentially just moved it over into the parks. So you'll see that when we get to the cemetery budget. Um, we are requesting to replace a 2000 F-250. Um, it is, as you can imagine, it's got a lot of years on it and with a lot of years comes a lot of problems. Um, uh, single wheel, um, three quarter ton pickup, doesn't have any type of snow removal attachments. Um, it's really not big enough to haul the mowers and stuff that we um, haul around. Uh, it's not really big enough to use it for that. Um, so we're asking to replace that. Um, we are also asking for a new trailer. Um, the mowers that we've been getting over the past few years um, are, are growing in size essentially. Um, so we can't put three of the mowers on the trailer that we currently have, three of the newer mowers, just because they just don't fit. We need a little bit larger mower. Um, we typically ask for a new mower every year. Um, I've got in this budget in 2023 uh, to replace two mowers for next year. That is based on um, whether or not we're able to purchase one mower this year. If we're able to get one this year, we would really only be asking for one next year. So it's really just going to be based on whether we're able to get that or not. And then the same thing on the UTV, um, that was actually budgeted for in 2022. So we're just gonna have to see if we're gonna be able to get it as opposed to running it over to next year. That kind of covers the bigger stuff in the budget. Um, if you have any questions for me, I would be happy to try to answer them for you. I think the UTV, was that to be able to go on the trails to, to maintain the parks, I guess? I, yeah, I think that's a great idea. The park up north, I've noticed it when the big truck goes out there and does some work, it's, it starts <laughs> wider than the trail, yeah. and therefore the mud, yeah. So creates a lot of damage to yeah. the turf, and, you know, it just creates more work and more hassle, and, you know. I agree. I think yeah. that's a good idea. I don't know, the mowers, the one's got 760 hours. That could be one we keep another year, if possible, and then replace it next year and get over 1,000 hours. Is that typically how many hours a year would we put on? Yeah, I would say we probably, depending on the year, obviously, because sometimes we mow all the way up until November. But yeah, you're probably average to that, you know, 300, 300 hours a year. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, Commissioner? Do you have certain brands of mowers that work best for you, too? Have you got different ones you use? Yeah, we've tried a couple of different types of mowers, and the one that we found really suits what we want or what we use, um, suits us best is uh, the Kubota. Um, it's got the, it's shaft driven mower, and it's one of the only ones that we've really found that was shaft driven as opposed to a belt driven deck. Yeah. And uh, some of the older ones, the belt driven ones, we would break a lot of belts and those things are about 120 to 140 bucks a piece and mm -hmm. if you go through four or five of those a year it becomes a real problem so these shaft driven mowers we really haven't experienced too many issues with them so on those with mowers and stuff do you guys typically try to keep same models model families so you're buying the same tires you need buy four tires you know instead of buying in theory if we could get it to that yes that would be that would be best so that we would just be all of the blades, all of the everything. filters, everything would be exactly the same. So yes, if we could get to that point, it would be great. And is that why you sometimes try to get multiples in a year? So then you're not buying one the next year that's the same model, yes. but it uses a different oil filter or yeah. different? That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I am um, always uh, amazed about the number of staff that the parks department has and that we continue because i know that you obviously know that I mean, parks is a priority for me and that we continue to add park space we continue to make changes to the parks but um when is the last time you asked for new staff in the parks department i'd have to look back commissioner i do not know that uh, do i don't know that answer right off the top of my head either. Yeah. i was believe. surprised when i saw this that um, that there wasn't a new staff recommendation. And when we have a, a full crew, quite honestly, I, and DJ, don't let me speak for you here, but I believe that we feel pretty, pretty comfortable Good. with what we're able to keep up with. And I 
don't think we have a lot of complaints about what our parks look like, you know, overall. Uh, I, I think once in a while we get behind in the cemeteries a little bit. That's uh, maybe a little different than the parks at that point in time, but, uh, you know. Look, you are correct. I mean, looking at the things that we add and the amount of work, for, you know, that goes, that we're asking of our staff, um, it does become overwhelming at points. And I do think that some things suffer a little bit um, here and there because we don't have the staff to do some of the things that we do. Um, but overall, in general, I think that we're able to get the things done. Um, would an extra body be nice? Yes, absolutely it would. We didn't ask for it this year. We were really fortunate this year to be able to get some summer help. Uh, we've got some really good um, people working for us right now that are gonna help us get through the summer. So um, looking good as far as that goes this year. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you next. I think something like last year, year before we had trouble finding summer help. Yeah, this year looks pretty good, say. So, yes, yeah. I've got I've got two summer help hired already, and one of them is supposed to start within the next few weeks. So yeah, yeah it's, it's looking good. Anything else on the park, buddy? <clears throat> on that, uh, the truck with the snow plow. Where would you guys typically clear that the street department? Do you guys do Forest Park? Yes. Or is that street department looks through when they're doing it, or is that just you guys? We could get the street department to do that. <laughs> yeah. No, typically we do um, Forest Park. We do all of the parking lots in all of the parks. Um, we do all of the trails. Um, actually, we do, and eh, not so much anymore. We used to do all of the city owned parking lots, but we've actually got a little bit of help from the utilities helping us out doing that. Um, but anywhere we do all of the sidewalks throughout, mm -hmm. you know, the city parks and all of the city owned sidewalks. So we still do quite a bit. Yeah. Mostly on the truck side of it, it would be parking lots and the roads mm -hmm. going through uh, Forest Park and around. Commissioners, any other questions on the park? On the cemetery? All right. So this one looks a little better when you just take a quick glance at it. Um, it's going to reflect a decrease of uh, $4,800. Um, and that's mainly due to we were able to purchase a mini excavator this year, um, which is really going to help out with the cemetery once that piece of equipment arrives. It's kind of like the bucket truck that Dennis was talking about, not quite as bad as that, but it's we got it ordered as soon as we could. and. They basically said, we'll get it to you when we can. So, um, right. <laughs> um, it does show in this budget um, that we took away from the fuel line, like what I had mentioned for the parks budget. Um, but essentially, that just moved straight over to the park so that we could take care of it out of that uh, as far as the groundskeeping, the majority of. Um, and then the only the only big purchase that we were requesting in the cemetery budget was um, to purchase a new mower for 2023. It was budgeted in for 2022, but we're making we're making the assumption that we're not going to be able to get it this year potentially, and so we were just going to push that one over to 2023 if we if we are unable to get it in 2022. And in the cemetery budget, also we have a line item for those cases where there is no family available to do some repairs to stones, right? That is correct. And that's for both cemeteries. All three cemeteries. And probably not enough to fit the entire need, especially when it comes to the um, above ground vault. Yes, that is correct. We've began budgeting. Um, we asked for, and it was approved last year for a $20,000 um, line item for that type of thing for the resetting of some of the stones that were in bad shape in some of our cemeteries um, we're going to ask for that same number um, next year and probably the year following just so that we're able to get some of those the older stones that are falling and deteriorating getting set back up the way that they need to be and the last couple of years we've actually had some help from a private citizen group that's doing veteran stones yep. in the hope cemetery and we i believe that i believe we furnish them materials yes stuff yeah. like that yeah we provide them with a cleaner that um, you can't just go out and clean a stone with just any type of chemical so we provide them with a specific chemical that um, 
they use to clean a lot of the older veteran stones and they do a really good job. They began at Hope Cemetery. So if you've ever been out at Hope Cemetery, some of those bright white stones, they, there was a lot of elbow grease that went into getting those things cleaned up. And most, oh, go, go ahead. No, you're right. most of that work is done by your staff. We don't outsource you know, that, that kind of work with the resetting and doing some of that. None work. of that is done by my staff. That, would, okay. that is all that officers. Is all, okay. The stuff that we're talking about at Hope, that's volunteer work. The only thing that we're providing them is just the cleaner. Mm -hmm. They are resetting those um, old military stones um, just as volunteer work. But the $20,000, that is budgeted as contract. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and in the last five years, we added the cemetery, not because we wanted to, but uh, it's very specific in the statute. If there is a cemetery that is abandoned, this one happened to be in the city limits. If it's abandoned, it goes to the local governmental unit. And on the grasshopper more, you're looking at replacing, even though it's useful life is not done yet. Uh, the idea to replace it would be for maintenance issues because of like the shaft driven commodities versus the belt? Is that Not necessarily on that one. Um, as you could imagine, um, some of those mowers rubbing across different head, you know, headstones and, you know, around trees and whatnot, like they get a little bit more dinged and banged oh, up see. out there inside the cemeteries as opposed to um, just in mowing in wide open areas. I got yeah. And then also, do we sell these on Purple Wave or how do we get rid of these? We do sell them on Purple Wave. The last one that we sold in the same auction that I heard um, Captain Weingart, or sorry, Chief Weingartner talking about um, this, sorry. Yeah. Oh, you weren't supposed to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Save some money in your budget. Yeah. <laughs> that last mower, it went for a little over 4,300. So, yeah. Good. Which that was a little more than what we had seen in previous years. Um, but if there's any other questions of DJ for the cemeteries, when are we going to any idea? I mean, you've reached out to somebody about purchasing the mowers and they've given you the same. We'll get it to you when we get it to you. Um, when we're talking about the mowers, when we ordered mower last year, we ordered it early in the year, March probably, and we didn't get it until November. And that was last year. So we've I'm just ordered the ones for this budget here. We haven't ordered one yet this year. We we did about half of our vehicle equipment list early on because we knew costs were going to be very high. And so we're just we're still in kind of limbo as to whether we're ready to move forward on anything at this point in time. We we tried to prioritize the things that we need the worst, uh, and that runs clear across public works at that point in time. We're not just talking parks and cemetery, we're talking streets and and the garage or whatever that may be. And so we tried to pri prioritize that list with the first half being the things that we needed, the, the works we thought. And so far we haven't even been able to get all of those. And the costs of those have been very high. Yeah, much more than what we had budgeted for. Yeah. And so we've only got so much money to work with. And, yeah. That's why you're seeing some of the stuff that maybe carry over to 2023. And you're mowing the disc golf courses over your own yard now, aren't you? <laughs> no <comment>. no. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a good laughs> Any other questions for DJ on cemeteries? Well, just for the, the trailer, the gooseneck, is that being pulled by the truck that you had asked for? In the other three parts, or is, is there a truck in this that um, we do have a truck at the cemetery that we could pull? Would be capable of pulling a gooseneck with a well, mini. I'm not asking for a gooseneck, so but a gooseneck, it's yeah, gooseneck. not a gooseneck, it's just a trailer. That's oh, sorry, be, oh, the dovetail, sorry, yes, okay, yeah, just it's going to be large enough to hold the uh, okay, the so, we get okay. Yeah. so we'll have multiple trucks, right? We'll do that, yeah. Thank Thank you, DJ. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. On to fleet maintenance. We want fleet maintenance next. I believe it's over here. Step up here. Chris. Here comes Chris. Well, As we Chris. talked before, folks, we you know I brought the I brought the experts. You know, so they're here to answer questions. Uh, you all know about our garage, but uh, our garage takes care of all of the vehicles and equipment uh, in in our fleet. Um, 
I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that, uh, you know, a typical fleet, uh, you have about 50 people to, or 50 pieces of equipment to every per personnel. Our garage has two people for about 150 pieces of equipment. Uh, we have implemented a process by which uh, uh, the garage is receiving some help from some of our other departments, uh, helping to do PMs and some of those kinds of things. A little bit of what you're going to see in this budget uh, reflects a need to that end. Uh, but uh, there again, the, the, our, our primary goal is just to keep everything running, keep everything moving, and 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 uh, it is a it is a uh, daunting task, you know, with with all of the things that work on it. But they do a great job. Uh, and all of the increases that we're talking about relate directly to uh, to keeping everything running. Uh, we are this year installing a new overhead crane, and so we've added some money that uh, reflects inspections of, of that overhead crane, and that will be an ongoing process. Uh, as we talked before, everything prices increase. All the parts that they buy at the garage are the same way. Prices have gone up on everything, absolutely everything. Uh, there was a, a, a bit of a, an increase uh, that uh, talks about uh, uh, specialty tools uh, every year. Every vehicle comes up with something else that, that we just don't have. We don't have that particular tool to get a particular job done. And, and so we are doing those on a consistent basis. And then we have an ask to, to begin the process of, of a community toolbox, what we're calling a community toolbox. As I just mentioned, and as maybe you know or don't know, our mechanics are required to furnish their own tools. And so because they're required to furnish their own tools, uh, we believe that it, uh, that when we're bringing other people in to help them, there should be some tools available to those people that are not our mechanics tools at that point in time. And so uh, as we go through that process, we're, we're going to try to build a box that, that, that helps that process. Uh, the overall ask on this budget is, is uh, just just under $30,000. And the vast majority of, of that ask is uh, the vehicle that they use for to, to make what we call service calls. Uh, the, the vehicle they have now is seen into life like a lot of other of our vehicles. And, and if any place, well, all of, our, all of our places need reliable vehicles, but this particular vehicle is what they use when we got something broke down out in the field and then they need to get there and, and get something done. With that, I would stand for questions. Is it 30,000? I'm looking at 50, I'm on the wrong page. No, you're right. No. There's yeah, three I mean, places, one truck. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I mean, you're, there's 50 on the one and six on the other. For the computer. Yeah. I'm sure there's probably some savings somewhere. Yeah, and, that, and that's exactly right. Is in, in in all of the budgets, uh, there, there was there are some decreases that off, offset the increases. Yeah, and so what I'm talking about is just the overall ask. Okay. That time. And and there again, and I didn't mention that. Uh, probably remiss in doing so, but the, but we are looking at trying to purchase a couple of iPads out there, and not iPads actually. Uh, and Chris, you can explain that laptops. Okay. But uh, right now they're running back and forth to the office uh, to, to do anything that they need to do technology wise. Some kind of tablet or something. And, and so, yeah, laptops and tablets uh, that are right out there on a station where they can get to them without running back and forth to the office. Is the service truck you have now a likewise truck? No, we will go down. We don't need one that big. All well, we got things a two ton. I've you know, just a one ton with the service body on it. That was my question with the fifty thousand dollars for a two ton with a crane. I wrote. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. That's what it's saving. It's savings and just the gas savings yeah, from going from a two ton to a one ton. I mean, there you too. go. Yeah, fifty thousand dollars gas savings. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. 
All of those things are things that we've tried to look at, you know, as, as we look at equipment, we, we don't ask for things that, that are unnecessary. Commissioners, any questions for Dennis or Chris on this department? I think like you said, the community toolbox makes a lot of sense. I was shocked to hear that the mechanics are required to bring their own tools. Honestly, that I think in time should be something probably brought up that as expensive as tools are, that seems. And, and we are going to do an ask commissioner, quite honestly, if it doesn't necessarily reflect in the budget, uh, but because of, uh, of what we have asked of. And I have to say, it's not atypical. Uh, uh, most places right. operate that way with mechanics. Okay. Uh, but most places provide some sort of stipend mm -hmm. in order for them to be able to purchase tools for their boxes along mm -hmm. through the year. And uh, quite honestly, that is not necessarily a budget request that we'll make, but we will make that request to the city manager. Uh, kind of like we provide shirts and jeans and some of those other things that would mm -hmm. be the same thing. And we were, are in the process of creating that memo to the city yeah, manager to look at that statement. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Chris, I think this is an absolute integral part of the city. Uh, one of the things, this department, um, um, because one of the things that we always talk about is the life of the equipment um, that, you know, the, the employees use. And we're always talking about it. it's supposed to last 10 years and it's 15 or 18 or something like that. Um, it's because of, you know, not only the employees that you have that, that take good care of the equipment, but when it comes in, it's maintained. Yep. So we appreciate what you and your cohort down there does um, to to take care of the equipment. Well, thank you. Good job. Thank you. That'll move us on to inside. streets. Come here, Justin. Sit up for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Justin. Good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. And introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Justin Hardy. Hardy. I'm with the uh, I'm the uh, Superintendent of the Street Department. What do you got for us? And so I'm going to talk again. Like I said, I know yes, if you, it was you or you're going to pass it on. I, like I said, I brought the experts. Not all of our experts were in a hurry to, to make a presentation. So <laughs> so uh, we are uh, we're taking baby steps here. Let's call it that. How's that? Uh, so there again, the street department, y'all know what they do. Uh, uh, everything from you know uh, plug and potholes to uh, snow removal to uh, st you know some of the stormwater work that gets done out there to you know some of the mowing and the right of ways that gets done out there it runs again. Uh, it, there's all kinds of work that you know, we call them streets and you think all they do is just work on the streets. Well, that's not even close. Not even close. So the the overall request here is. Uh, two hundred and three thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars. Again, the vast majority of that is in a, a couple of trucks. Uh, and just increase in prices. We've asked for an increase in fuel. We've asked for an increase in oil uh, and just some of the commodities, day to day commodities that, that exist out there. Uh, some of the aging equipment, this, this fleet is, is fairly significant with our dump trucks and, and, and the types of things that they work with on an ongoing basis. And uh, so there's some, some money that's set aside just for repair of, of some of that aging fleet. Uh, the, the biggest pieces of that are, again, a one-ton flatbed. There's actually two one-ton flatbeds uh, that are in this department. One of those we are still hoping to replace this year. Uh, we, we keep looking uh, and we just simply haven't found one that we thought was uh, worth the money. The only, and just as an example, the one, one ton that we were able to find with, with the dump bed on it was almost $100,000. We budgeted 50, you know, and that's the kind of thing that we're running into. Uh, the other is a 1998 two-ton dump truck uh, with a salt spreader uh, that we're hoping to replace in 2023. Um, really, those are the, the, the significant things in, in this budget. Uh, 
Justin has worked very hard and you'll see uh, again in this budget, you'll see some reductions that have offset some increases to try to keep this as reasonable as we could. So you, got, you think you're gonna have trouble replacing, finding trucks to replace these at this point? I mean, we don't think so, we know so. Yeah. You know already, so it could be you ordered this year and not come till next year or is there? We don't even wanna order them because order. of the price. Okay. What they're telling us right now to order one, and we set through, we've set through several conversations. We can order one today, but it's still that $100,000 number and we might not see it for 18 months. And we just don't believe that that's reasonable. We were able to find one which actually went to one of the utility crews. We ended up paying 83,000 for it. And we thought that was a little high, but we, we need the trucks. And there again, that's why we took that first half and we don't know if we're gonna get to the second half or not, just because of cost. Dennis, can you repeat the requested increase amount? Because I thought I heard you say something else. Yeah, the requested increase amount for the total for streets is 203.625. Okay. I thought I heard you say something else. Thank I'm you. sorry. I was probably stuttering. No, that's right. <laughs> I gulped because I'm not the expert. I mean, you said it. <laughs> I'd say we got our usefulness out of that 1998. Mm -hmm. It's well used. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, any questions for DJ or Dennis on this budget? I guess How about Justin? I'm sorry, Justin. 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 Sorry. That's DJ, you want to answer that? Yeah, let's, yeah. let's go with Justin. Sorry. Today. He's busy thinking about the next one. Sorry. He's Justin. going to be sorry. extremely disappointed if you don't come up with a question. <laughs> I can ask you a question. Yeah, can ask you a question. <laughs> what question did we answer? Yeah, there you go. Don't say that one. But on, the, yeah, on that truck with, that, with 90, 98, I, mean, I guess the fact that it's got rusty corrosion and it's a salt truck, is that related to that? That could, could be any vehicle. Maybe that's that all. Age. That's all due to the fact that it's a salt spreader. It's a salt spreader. Yeah. I guess so. It made sense to me. Then, so, how many of the salt spreaders do we have? Uh, we have four. We have four. Yep. Have you seen any wear and tear like that on the other ones? Uh, not as much as this one, but this is the oldest, oldest one in the fleet. Yeah. Sure. Is that enough questions? That's. That's. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, any other questions for Justin or Dennis on this uh, department? I think we're good. And again, just as a reminder, everybody, I guess we're going to be talking about financing all these, if or some or all or none, later on. Is that right? Yeah. And we'll throw them all in as one big group. Check. Okay. <laughs> and, and Director Landis has that worked out. And she keeps telling me she has that worked out. Okay. But, uh, we're assuming to pay cash for some of them and yeah, then finance right. some others. So. And, and we just got to decide how to, what percent or what we'll pay, pay cash for it, I guess. We'll just talk about that later. Okay. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Thank you both. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will move us on to Community Development and Building Maintenance with Director Hall. Mm -hmm. Give them some time to all. They're not leaving around. because of you. They're not leaving because of you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Commissioner. So I arrived here March 21st. Um, so it was after the budget process kind of got started. <laughs> so, um, and uh, really, uh, some of that work had been done by our building official, Terry Elmer, who I think you all know, and also our administrative assistant, Betsy Carlson. Um, and then finance director kind of accommodated me a little bit to allow me to catch up as the city manager. Um, so the development uh, department. Um, so primarily what we do is, is uh, process permits. We also do codes inspection. That's that's building maintenance codes, that's property maintenance codes, and also zoning codes inspection. Uh, we also process and review uh, applications for zoning and subdivision plats. Uh, and then there's long range planning. Uh, and then something you're aware of is administration of the neighborhood revitalization program. 
I'd say the public benefit to all that is uh, public safety, um, protecting property owners and buyers uh, of homes and, and, and businesses. Uh, also, uh, quality of life um, and uh, trying to create as much harmony between uses, between land uses as possible, uh, trying to prevent conflicts between land uses. Um, so we have six full-time positions in, in community development to carry out this work. Um, so what this proposed budget represents is maintenance of current current staffing, current budgeted staffing levels um, to continue to deliver those services. The primary uh, request here is for an increase of twenty-eight thousand uh, dollars to uh, fund contractual services for an update to comprehensive plan. So, if you were to go out and do a entire comprehensive plan, a new comprehensive plan, uh, that would likely cost easily over eighty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. That's not really exactly what's needed. Um, the comprehensive plan that we currently have was uh, written and adopted 2004, 2005. Uh, there was an update in 2018 that I'm aware of. It, it wasn't a, a wholesale comprehensive update. A lot of things have happened since then. Uh, we had a, a recession in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, really affected the housing market, especially. Uh, since then, we kind of had a slow period of growth. Uh, then we had a uh, pandemic, um, and uh, where we find ourselves now is, is uh, housing affordability and, and just providing housing. So there are some issues that have occurred in the last few years. And then, of course, uh, the census, we had a new census in 2020. Um, and so it, it is a good time to update the comprehensive plan. The challenge is, is trying to to determine how to do do it uh, exactly. I think that uh, what this involves uh, over the next uh, 18 months or over the next six months to a year is to determine a scope of work for doing that update and determining what can be done in-house, what can be done, uh, or what needs to be done by a consultant. Um, I'd say the things that can be done in-house, uh, quite a bit can, but I think where we're challenged a little bit is by the data gathering, uh, updating the data, and then also the visioning and the public engagement part of it. If you want that done well, I think that's going to require some consulting to do that. And so that's that's what that represents. It, it's hard to estimate at this time what that's going to cost. Uh, you really need to get uh, proposals from from uh, from consultants and. Um, it's hard to do that without understanding the scope of work, and that's kind of where we're at. So um, that's the that's the number we arrived at. Um, other than that, there's really I don't think there's anything hugely significant here, but I'll be happy to take any questions you have um, and comments. <coughs> questions? Any uh, commissioners? Any questions for Director Hall? In this year's budget, um, you have uh, you in this year's 2022 budget, you have um, moving our codes inspector from part time to full time. Has that already happened? Let me help okay. Mike out here. Yes. All right. So what that was was actually taking the position that is dedicated to uh, nuisances, writing nuisances, expanding that going to a full time. That was the plan. Um, I am not authorized at the be filled yet because as you know um, we've had some extraordinary expenses at the front of the year in community development so i want to make sure we're on good ground and the priority is uh, we did not anticipate the planning position being vacant and the priority is to get that planning position uh, filled so that um, Mike can have the professional backup that he needs to have. But it's still there. Okay. Commissioners, any other questions for Director Hall? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Do you want to move on to building maintenance? Yes, thank you. Um, so you might have some questions. Some of these questions are a little bit more on the, you know, what what some of the numbers are behind the building maintenance, and and uh, Terry can probably help out with some of that. Um, so this department has three full time positions and one part time position. Uh, we maintain and clean the, the city buildings, including City Hall, Auto Memorial Auditorium, and Cardi Carnegie Cultural Center, and we provide uh, repair and maintenance to other facilities on an as needed basis. The budget really reflects uh, maintaining the current staffing levels. Um, there are some increased operating costs anticipated due to infl inflation and, and whatnot. Uh, it also includes a uh, capital project increase or budget, I shouldn't say increase because we, we've had that in the budget in the past, uh, of $50,500 to, to, uh, to fund anticipated building maintenance expenses. For example, one of the big projects last year and this year has been a replacement of original windows in this building for greater energy efficiencies. Over the years, we we did the canopy out here. Uh, we fixed leaks, um, HVAC, um, anything that has to do with building maintenance, not only here, but almost any other building is what that amount covers. And that could easily be 100000 a year. I also want to point out is some of the, the items that can be funded by building maintenance are things that you just don't know are going to happen. Um, and if something goes bad, you have to fix it. Um, the, there's something called a Liebert uh, yeah. unit uh, that I didn't know about until I got here. Um, there, you know. <laughs> there are two of those that, that keep our server room cool, which has to happen uh, to maintain the integrity of our IT. Um, we replaced one of them recently, and um, that could happen again. That's not something you really have a choice in. It's something you have to replace because you need to have a cooler and you need to have a backup. Um, as I understand, uh, there are several HVAC units in the Carnegie Cultural Center. Each one of those costs potentially $10,500. And if something like that goes out, that's something you need to replace. Uh, the other, other things are like uh, city manager talked about on uh, windows. And some of it is just maintain the, the, the facilities so it doesn't become to a point where everything fails at once. Um, the other request in here is to replace the van um, that, that uh, is used by building maintenance. And uh, we've estimated that that's going to cost $30,000 to do that. Um, the van currently is just starting to do what old vehicles do. Uh, they have repairs that you don't want to make because they exceed the value of the, the vehicle. So that's where we're at on the on the uh, on the van. And uh, if you have any questions or comments? I'll... You meant by a used van or this thirty thousand? Is that going to get the van purchased? I would say that that is a um, a used vehicle, but not you know not well used. <laughs> and I would I would say I would remind that the van he's talking about is the one that went to building maintenance when we bought the other van. So our thinking is that we replace that van. We have two vans in the pool ready for for when people go to the meetings and they don't have to take their own um, personal car. Did, did we not lose a vehicle though to Pardon me? fire or something not too long ago? That's going to be replaced? No. No. So, no. no. We, we, we did. Uh, that is, we got uh, we're talking about to the insurance company and and uh, yeah. we'll replace it in that way. Yeah, but it's probably not getting it's, the answer we want yet. It's history. <laughs> it, it went okay. down in flames. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the second floor window replacement, that estimate, how many windows does that cover? Is that all the second floor or portions? That would be portions of the second floor. We started to do that. It is, there's portions, so I think. Almost all the windows have been replaced in my corner. They actually started with Wendy's over the last couple of years and kind of worked around. And, 
And if you kind of come up there and look, you can see what's happening with the so ceiling. Same question with the atrium window replacement. Is that all of the atrium window replacement? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I would imagine at some point all of those do need to be replaced. Well, no, I'm not saying they don't need to be replaced. I'm just trying to figure out if that cost is covering all or just some. Not all. So, but is this estimate on here to replace all of the atrium windows? Oh, okay. I believe so. Okay. Including the ones that we covered years ago? Okay. I don't know. I, I don't That's know deep. the okay, answer to that. And, 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 it, <laughs> and certainly information I'd like to have because, I mean, if we're, if we're estimating 16 now and we got more to be placed on yeah. the road, it's just something to think about. Here's, let me, let me tell you how this has worked. Um, that is not for all the windows, but we've set aside money every year in those categories to do whatever <laughs> windows we can up to that cost. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Does that answer that? Yes. Commissioners, any other questions for Director Hall on maintenance, building maintenance? That might just be one window. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. On to information technology with Paul Summer. I'll put on a coat and everything. Do you see this? Wow. It's just because you're cold, right? Okay. It's wow, that would gussy myself up when I get up. Do a presentation there. Good evening, yeah. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, I'm Paul Summer, <laughs> IT Director. The IT Department supports the technology needs of all the other city departments. And uh, kind of the highlights of what we're looking at, we're expecting an increase in dues and subscriptions, and those include things like our Office 365 from Microsoft. We'd like to add some security features if it's possible. Uh, so that's why that's going to go up a little bit, hopefully. And then on the capital purchases, we're still trying to get monitors again. I know we added some more last year. We still did not have enough money in the computer budget to get monitors for each computer this year, which we had quit doing a few years ago when we cut back. We just kind of let it ride with the monitors that we had. Uh, and so we still haven't fully started replacing those again. But other than that, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you would have. <clears throat> so, Paul, tell me, are you asking for, I, I don't see what's asking what for an increase or a decrease, or <laughs> if so, what amount? Where's the dollar? The, probably in the news of subscriptions, uh, I think you're, you're going to see close to $5,500 just in the dues and subscriptions. And then on the capital purchases, I think you're looking at 3000 or so there. Uh, and then probably around another 1000 for uh, these meeting rooms. I know we've been talking a lot about the meeting rooms. I just want to make sure we've got enough in there to handle any IT related things that may change down here uh, going forward as well. So roughly a 9500 increase. Yeah, and that does not include any, uh, you know, personnel increases or anything like that, merit increases or. Commissioners, any other questions for Paul? Thank you, Paul. All right, thank you. That's really too short. <laughs> On to uh, fire with Chief Mathias. Good evening, Chief Mathias. Good evening. Mayor, commissioners, do you want numbers? I got them. All right. All right. So. There's benefit to being at the end because we're already worn down. That. We're already I'm worn down, and you're like, less questions. And I was thinking I was going to oh. hit you up about that earlier. It's. We get coped. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to give you a little uh, history on, on our department for Commissioner Clayton and, and for everybody. But. Uh, the Ottawa Fire Department was started in 1867. That's 155 years ago. Uh, we currently have 21 full-time employees with eight uh, great volunteers. Uh, we're an all-hazard uh, responding fire department. Uh, we fight fires, respond to medical calls, rescue type calls, and hazardous materials. Um, so we'll jump into 
Uh, so I am the fire department's asking for a budget request increase of three thousand three hundred and three thousand nine hundred and seventy five dollars over the twenty two budget. Uh, fifty thousand of that is in overtime, uh, and I'll explain that here in a minute. Um, as everybody stated earlier, fuel is going up. Uh, and so we do our best to offset our response to the type of calls we have. Uh, and if we have the appropriate staffing, we, were, we are able to take a smaller uh, vehicle. If not, we take the big, big trucks. And so uh, we try our best to, to lessen the load on the big trucks, but with staffing, we just, it, I'd say 80% of the time we're taking the big trucks. And we get, I get asked, quite often why you take a big truck to a medical call or to you know whatever it is, a non-fire call. Well, we can't go back to the station if we get a fire call and then respond to your fire. So, uh, you know, it's it's probably some education that we need to do at the fire department and just reach out to the citizens. And, you know, we, we drive them for a reason. We don't try to drive excessively on the miles because we keep them. We have a 96 unit right now that will be replaced next year. So, you know, we keep them for a long time and we try to take care of them. Um, then we uh, move on down to um, our operating expenses. Again, the fuel is, is a big, uh, and Lisa Borges, she did a study for us and ran our uh, gallons per year and then at a five dollar a gallon rate and that's already over that so hopefully we'll go down but uh we currently i looked at our budget today and we're below below where we should be at this time of year so you know we we're trying uh one of the things that we are it's unfortunate but we call it rms reporting management system uh, we went with, we changed about six years ago. And since then, that company has been bought out by another company. And they're, they're uh, increasing their costs significantly and offering less uh, options. And so we're wanting to go to a different uh, RMS system. And with that is about a $6,000 increase over what we currently spend on that uh, that type of system. Uh, and then, um, so our, our firefighters, your firefighters, uh, are certified in multiple uh, multiple skills. And, and the big five are rope <coughs> rescue, which includes high angle, low angle, uh, vehicle extrication, uh, trench rescue, confined space rescue, and grain elevator rescue, uh, grain bin rescue. And so to keep keep our folks up to speed, that takes time and money. And uh, so we try to break off one of those uh, rescue skills every year. And in 23, will be rope rescue. We have a lot of new firefighters uh, that since the last time we've offered that about six years ago. So they'll be an initial going through the, that's a week long course. So uh, there's some added overtime there. Plus uh, the folks that have it already will be recertified. Um, we had talked last week about utilities and redoing the water tanks and water towers. If they get hung up, that's, we'll be there and uh, you know doing the best we can. And, so uh, it, that's what we do. Um, on to the overtime. So right now we're a little over uh, the year for our overtime. Uh, that's due to increased calls. Uh, we're um, we are seventy two calls over from last time this year, and we keep that average up. Will be one hundred and seventy eight calls over from the year before. And we'll be hitting the 2000 mark the first time in our history if we continue on the rate that we're going. Now, are, are those all calls? Those aren't just fire calls? So those EMS are calls for service. Yeah. So yeah, they're not all 
emergency calls. There, if we do a permit to burn, Mike wants to Commissioner Skidmore wants to burn in his backyard. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> we were over there, right? One day, it wasn't? Yes, but we got that off. Yeah, time. yeah. So uh, <laughs> the neighborhood didn't burn down. So. No, we we got there, but <clears throat> we're good. <laughs> and the other thing is, and this might take a little bit to explain, but with with our firefighters, the schedules they work in uh, in two hundred twelve in twenty eight days, they work two hundred twelve hours. Mm -hmm. And I have to give them four hours off every 28 days because they actually would work 216. FSLA only says you can work 212. So we either pay them overtime or give them time off, the four hours off. And I'm, the four hours off is a nightmare, scheduling nightmare. Plus our guys, Typically, we'll come in at noon. You know, what can you do for a couple hours? Now, some of them use it to go to a kid's ball game or mm -hmm. church or whatever. But all in all, it is a scheduling mess to get schedule these four hours off. And so uh, I worked with the finance department and the biggest increase, about 33, 34,000 of that overtime is for those hours, four hours every 28 days. Of overtime now that they they'd still be eligible to take it if they're on vacation they can you save four hours of vacation uh, but if a person works that and we would pay them overtime we do now and with some of our staffing issues we've had uh, we've paid we paid out pretty frequent this year already so uh, that's been that's been that four hours off since I can remember and it was a major <coughs> issue 20 years ago and it still is today so uh, would really like that to, to proceed forward um, our drone so thirty thousand thirty five thousand dollars for a drone is I'm not a technology person uh, it's a lot of money for a drone but what what that drone can do is is far beyond what our current drones. I believe uh, PD has two. We have two. Uh, we've had calls where all of them are in use. Uh, we have currently we have four FAA certified pilots. Uh, that's a pretty substantial uh, investment and uh, time for them to get uh, their pilot's license. Uh, <coughs> They're all certified to fly at night, and we've had 24 emergency flights since 2020, uh, but we've also had numerous flights for utilities, IT, um, community development, and ORC. We've flown quite a few times for them, So, uh, and then we do get asked to go out in the county fairly, uh, I'd say probably six times a year. Uh, so, and those are typically on emergency type calls. Uh, every once in a while, we went and found a gun that was in, involved in a city crime this this winter. So, what this drone can do is carry a, I believe it's six pounds, so it can carry a life jacket if we have somebody out in the river, and we can drop a life jacket, cell phone, what you know anything less than six pounds uh our current flight on our our uh, current drones is about a quarter to half mile uh this one is nine mile range and our pilots are certified uh i don't know the lingo but they can fly beyond what they can they can see it uh if they don't have that certificate they can only fly where they can see the drone um and so it's it's just a totally advanced uh, drone, and why it's thirty five thousand for the fire department. Uh, we originally said, okay, we'll split it between utilities, PD, uh, community development, and so we can lessen, you know, just spread it out. But uh, we went ahead and, and did it, and uh, I, if it was one piece of equipment that I never thought would make a difference, it would be a drone, but it has made a, a huge difference in 
in what we do. Not, not just the fireside, emergency side, but also for for Dennis and his folks. And uh, and we've done a couple of roofs uh, for codes and just saves on people getting up on a roof. Uh, let me see if I've covered everything. Oh, so this last this last big ticket item. Uh, currently, we have a what we call Squad One. It's a 2005. A uh, ton uh, truck, four door, and it has a kind of a rescue box on it. Currently, it runs medical calls and extrication calls and those type of calls. Um, we we acquired that truck in 2005 on a FEMA grant. It's the only vehicle that we've been able to be successful in the FEMA grant uh, realm. And that cost the city at that time $6,938.75. The total cost of the, the build was $168,700. So uh, ideally, it only cost us roughly $7,000 to purchase. Uh, the back half of that unit has cost us dearly. Um, we've had to replace the motor in it. A uh, couple pumps, and it wasn't anything to do with our drivers, our engineers. It's been all to do with the way that truck has been set up and built. Uh, what we're what we're asking is to pull the back of that truck off the rescue body and put it in on a wild wildland type uh, <coughs> arrangement. And I, I believe it said in here somewhere where. Uh, interface, uh, urban interface. And that's what that is, is what you have between the city and the country is uh, like proximity park and all the vegetation out there mm -hmm. up at the coves where the housing meets the, the rule. Um, and again, I believe I said this in Hutchison, they lost 38 homes in a subdivision uh, due to a wildland fire in they just couldn't get in and get enough personnel on the fire. I, unfortunately, I mean, I, I, if that can happen in Hutchison or Boulder, Colorado, or anywhere else, it can sure happen here in, in Ottawa, Kansas. And so um, we're looking to just kind of repurpose that truck. It's got 20,000 20, miles on it. Uh, and to, again, we go into the, uh, Available chassis, uh, that truck would be probably a 25, uh, 2025 version uh, where we can reuse the, the <coughs> chassis and put a new box on it and extend the life out 10 to 15 years. So, a lot of thrown at you really quick. Um, I'd stand for any questions. So we're just looking at <clears throat> replacing the back end of the truck where you've got yeah so for the, what, what, what's it, I mean, what do we have now what will it look like if we do this yeah um, so I, I wouldn't say it looks similar but uh so currently the the box is very square and carries more it's got a 80 horse motor in the back of that thing to run the run the pump and so uh at the time we we spec'd it out and was successful in the, the grant that's what that was our first of this kind of truck we've ever had. And so we looked at it as being a somewhat a supplement of a, a large fire truck to help fight house fires with. And we don't, we don't, that has changed. Yeah, with the volatility of plastics and furniture, and I would not put anybody in a house that's got a, the hose coming out to that truck. So just our overall mission with that truck has changed. Uh, the more we uh, annex, you know, we're annexing farm ground or pastures or whatever, we need trucks to, to get out there and, and do that too. So yes, it, would, it wouldn't look like a rural fire truck, a, a pickup, but it's, it'll have some boxes on it, but It'll have it'll look somewhat different. I, I can bring actually we're kind of mimicking off of a truck that Manhattan Fire Department here in Kansas has, 
and we can when we get more into this definitely bring you some pictures That's of that. Saying, so okay. yeah. And if you with fleet management stuff, do they feel comfortable with a truck that's a 2005, so it's already, you with 20,000 miles, hopefully low enough mileage, or it's not taxed very hard. Well, I tell you, if Chris was still here, he would he would absolutely say get rid of that back into that truck. <laughs> yeah. He, those guys, and let me throw in a kudo for those, those mechanics, because I don't know if we could afford any of our departments if we didn't have that, if we didn't have those guys, the mechanics. I would... They're probably two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year if we had to take that out, all of our trucks out to get worked on. Uh, they're invaluable in my mind. They keep our trucks running and, and they do a great job. But yes, that truck has had some issues, and I'm telling you, they would. The, he, Chris would probably be sitting right beside me if if he was here right now, saying, "Yeah, let's get, let's do something with this truck." So it's not the it's not the truck itself. It's just the box. <coughs> yeah. They, yeah. So explain to me if you're because you're talking about the retrofit here, how that would alleviate the purchase of three vehicles in the budget you're talking about. Well, it wouldn't alleviate the three purchases. We our vehicle replacement program has in 2025 three vehicles being purchased. If we retrofitted that would drop drop one of those off. It's so it's designed to be replaced in 2025 if we don't <coughs> repurpose it sure so instead of three it would be that we don't have two replacements in 25. okay so there still would be two and so it would alleviate the purchase of one vehicle yes okay yeah, yeah. yep Commissioners, any other questions for Chief Matthias? Okay. I think we're good. Thank you very Thank much. You, Chief. Have a move us on to finance and the city clerk with uh, Melanie Landis. Well, thank you. Oh, this was all part of my plan to let them all read down mm -hmm. and be the last one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my entire plan of 10 minutes per department we blew that out the window in the first like <laughs> just a little while but but i do appreciate the process and the questions and being engaged and trying to learn what each of the, these departments need um to well i'll i have a, i do have a couple of wrap-up comments after we talk about the finance department there's um the finance department budget is is small uh, we are split um, between the general fund and the utility administration division and the electric fund. So our budget for the finance and city clerk budget altogether is relatively small. So our total increase without <coughs> the, the ask of the transfer is about $7,500. We reduced our contractual expenses because of we had contracted with an outside person to provide some finance professional services in the past when we were without a finance director. Um, and so that includes even all of the personal increases. Um, that aside, every the other ask um, for this year is to consider a transfer um, and, and I pose it as a transfer instead of the purchase of because we don't know exactly where we're going to head with this but we do need to upgrade or replace our existing accounting software system we are on an older version of um, Tyler Technologies encode and it is version 9 and they do support version nine um, with a little less effort than they do their current version, which is 10. And so um, we would either want to um, look into further upgrading to 10 or look into something to completely replace it. Both of those are going to be big projects and um, not cheap, but an upgrade might be a little less expensive than a, than a complete replacement. So we did reserve a little bit of money out, out of last year's budget. Um, at the end of the year, um, your city manager uh, and I worked on putting some of that aside into a reserve account, uh, not necessarily specifically for this, but it could be used for this. And um, this would be an additional ask on top of that to help try and 
make sure that there's enough money there to be able to move ahead with this project. Um, anytime that you do an upgrade to software, it does take a long period of time. There's mm -hmm. a lot of planning. We have lots of moving parts and pieces. We have a few of our programs are hosted. Uh, I'm sorry, a few of them are on premise here, which is our court programs, and most all of the rest of them are hosted um, by Tyler Technologies, and so they, um, it is a little more expensive to do it that way, but from my understanding is that they, that's about the only way they offer anymore. They don't really offer a lot of the, these software, the modules that you can actually even use on premise. So we would be moving probably everything in that direction at some future point, and I can answer questions all day long about the software and why we need to upgrade and those things, but I don't know what you really want to know. So or do you have questions about that? Um, I, do, I would propose that this be split because we do equally use that software system across all funds. So every utility is using it for billing, for receiving, uh, for invoice, all of those things, as well as the general ledger and payroll and AP. So we would say 25,000 would come from the general fund, 25 from water, wastewater, and electric equally. So I know it's for 100,000, but, but it would only hit the general fund at 25,000 or any amount that we were to come up with between now and the end of this budget process. Okay. We'll, go ahead with we'll that, Tyler. How long we've had that? We've had that for you know, it's before your time, I know. I want to say 2012, possibly. Might be when it was. Yeah. Another yeah. <coughs> challenge. <coughs> now, I say that there's some reasons for that being a challenge over the course of 10 years, but the program that Melanie has set up. Uh, most of my concern about future challenges are taken care of because of the way that she'll approach them. And anytime that you do an upgrade or a replacement system, while it is a very lengthy process, it gives you the opportunity to improve your chart of accounts, to, you know, um, over time things get messy, you can clean that up. You can, you know, a lot of the newer upgraded programs or new programs that are out there are they offer a different platform so it looks a little different it feels different it's easier to run reports it, they might have a dashboard for you to be able to look at things for department heads to look at them differently um, so there's lots of different opportunities with an upgraded system as well what's the estimated cost in new software so a couple of years ago, they got an estimate for just the upgrade, which didn't consider uh, some of the, um, it didn't consider everything that we have right now and or some of the improvements. And I want to say it was around 90,000. That was a couple of years ago. And that's something we talked with them about early last year when I came on board last year. But like we said, we identified several areas that weren't included. So I know that it, the actual estimate will be more than that just for the upgrade itself. So that kind of that maybe answers my question. It's just a one-time transfer of 100000 correct? Is that what you're asking for? Yes I, yes, I was just thinking if we set this money aside, we go out, we get estimates, we will want to do a full-blown RFP process, review uh, you know, different things, or we can decide to just do an upgrade and stick with Tyler Technologies and move to their newer version, which is 10, um, and decide what the best route is for the city. So yes, this would just be to get it set aside, let us move in the direction of getting that done um, so we can move on it when it's available because we're budgeting so far in advance. I, I guess I thought I heard you say 400,000 earlier. So 800,000. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. That's what I, I thought. Because okay. I thought I'm sorry, you said no. 400,000, and I was like, well, I got it. Okay. But it, it no, only shows 400,000. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure I might have fallen asleep over here. So, yeah, that's right. We've been here for three years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just clarifying here, okay? So I'm glad you clarified. I hope no, not to walk away with that. Come on. All these chairs did take it out. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, this would just be early, but do you know if there's a change in ongoing maintenance costs going from nine to ten? 
like I'm assuming we're on a subscription model for maintenance in general. We are, and, and I don't know that it would actually change. I don't know the answer to that, okay. but I I doubt we actually pay a lot yeah, for, in annual mm -hmm. maintenance for the hosted version of all of the different modules across the board. Um, so I wouldn't imagine that it would be more than that, but we'll definitely want to ask those questions yeah. when we get more in depth into that process. Well, I think there's QuickBooks free online if you want to do that. So. Oh, <laughs> That's a great suggestion. She'll, right. she'll take that under advisement. Yeah. Good idea. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. We get a little snarky after we've been here a while. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Commissioners, any other questions for Ms. Landis? Could she just, you know, bring 30, 45 minutes more stuff that yeah. she could talk to us about? I actually oh. probably could if you'd like. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no. No. Let's move on to comments. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so real quick, though, I do want to just answer a couple of the things that you guys have asked through this process. First of all, thank you, because I know it was a lot. I know that everyone appreciates you listening to them and because each of their functions are really important to them and overall. And the uh, everything that you saw was really just a first blush of everything. It was just get it in front of you. Let's talk about the reasons why we need these things. The numbers that are associated <laughs> with them, we still have an opportunity to um, I'm going to say narrow the scope on a lot of these items. There are some other opportunities, like you mentioned, are we going to lease finance these? Are we going to pay cash for these? Everything that's been put in front of you has been just cash only, right? So we wanted to get one big picture look, and then we want to come back and say, okay, now how can we approach this? Um, so we'll be working with everybody to prioritize these things, to weigh them against the funding that's available, and then bring recommendations back to you. Um, for example, uh, we talked about some building maintenance projects. We talked about the uh, larger project at the police department. We talked about some HVAC stuff. We talked about some small minor stuff. Um, here, there might be an opportunity to combine all of those things together, uh, finance that over four years under a temporary note, and just get it done and, and make payments over four years. We might be able to do that. It might be a good option, it may not, but we haven't explored all of those things yet. So everything that was brought to you was was just as a, a, a first look. So um, all I would ask is keep an open mind at this point and all of your feedback is really good for us to come back with a <laughs> recommendation for you. And that's all I have. Commissioners, any other questions or comments for Ms. Lanes? Thank you. Thank you. I'll move us on to the comments by our city manager. I have no commission. Comments by city well, commissioners. I do, but I won't. Yes, you can. <laughs> comments by city commissioners. Commissioner Taylor. Um, this weekend is a big weekend for many families, and last weekend was a big weekend for many families where there's um, graduation um, ceremonies. And um, I always like to say every year when it's right around graduation that um, we are so happy for those individuals who have um, done their hard work and are ready to graduate, but please don't feel like they need to leave the city of Ottawa. We want you here. Um, we want you to stay here. Uh, we want you to be a part of the future. So um, as you move on either um, in uh, out of university or out of high school, please know that we want you here in the city of Ottawa. And we are um, proud to have you and, and look forward to you being a part of the future. Thank you. Mr. Clayton. Uh, nothing other than I'm really excited for all the budget stuff to come. <sighs> Happy I mean, so knew you were going to say that. So I knew you were a numbers guy. Oh, boy. Nothing to say after that? Um, commissioners, we have an item on here discussion of interview for accessibility advisory board. Um, I guess I'll start off with do we want to have that discussion today? Um, and, and I know it could be short and sweet, but. Uh, um, would you like to wait a week? Talk about it next Monday. I I guess I don't want to feel like we're we're rushed in to make a decision, um, and I don't think we are. Um, and I in 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 light of recent events, uh, maybe we could sit and wait on you know a decision for a week or so. I hate, I hate to set a precedent on doing that. I mean, it, but I mean we certainly could. I just. Um, you know, whatever we choose to do is, is fine. I, I don't have a problem speaking about this uh, position today, or if you want to wait, that's fine. So, so tell me, what would you guys like to do? You tell me. 
on it. We're going to have late meeting on the 16th, looks like, too, now, aren't we? So we need similar. What we're going to be talking about. I, I, I just heard about half of it. We're here. Let's talk about it. Okay. I, I, there I you go. Just knock it out. There you I, go. I How do we feel about uh, Mr. Brown? I thought he did a pretty good job. The answers that I, I was looking for, I, I, I'm just a part of it. Nonetheless, I, I read his resume here and answered my question the way I was looking for it. So, Mr. Clark, so you're in favor of putting him, yeah. putting him on the Thank you, Mr. Clark. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would be in favor as well. I think his, obviously his work, he does with ADA and different stuff, and obviously works with people in the community already. Um, so even though he's, and I don't know the precedent, I guess, on these boards of people being outside of Ottawa, if that's a thing that typically happens, or if it, it, it the commissioner depends upon the on the board. So, mm -hmm. for example, on a planning commission, mm -hmm. by statute, you mm -hmm. have to have two from outside the city limits. So, um, on, on this particular board, I do not think there were any residency requirements mm -hmm. written into this one, and not uncommon. But yeah, I basically that I thought he would be great for it. So. So you're in favor also? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Kale? Um, I, yeah, I, I asked some detailed questions about like his HCBS and his um, working with the PD waiver and those particular things because those are things that I have um, history with working with and working with that population um, of in, and individuals who um, have disabilities. I, I think he probably brings I don't always like the idea of us bringing people from the outside inside, but I think he may bring a fresh set of eyes that may be beneficial to how we can do it better here in our community. So I'm in favor. Um, the only the only concern I have all the time, and I'm glad Commissioner Clayton asked, was uh, you know coming from Lawrence, uh, you know his his uh, application said that he could you know he could be here for an hour, and hopefully that's enough time for that board. Um, but his responses were great. His knowledge was was extensive, extensive. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm certainly in favor too. So I think we have consensus to uh, to let Mr. Brown know that we are uh, you know, appointing him to the accessibility advisory board. So um, comments by the mayor. I have no comments, um, and that'll move me on to announcements. We have a study session uh, next Monday at 4 p.m. Our regular meeting next Wednesday at uh, 10 a.m. Actually, actually, commissioners, hold on. Next Wednesday, 10 a.m., and I'm, I'm glad I remember this, um, is fifth grade promotion. And Commissioner Graves and I have a fifth grader that uh, I believe the promotion starts at 9, 930. Uh, she had sent me an email asking if uh, the commission would be in favor of maybe it, uh, maybe moving the meeting back till 11. Fine with me. We're talking about the 18th. Yeah, the 18th. It's fine with me. I don't think there's any issue for me. Sure. I, I've already got an appointment, but but I mean I can do an eight. Well, I can, can do we, earlier. I just can't do later, unless well, we do afternoon. Well, yeah, and I don't know what's on the agenda at this point. So I'm up at four thirty. <coughs> I know you are. Which okay, we're not I mean eight p.m. Right? Yeah. No. Uh, can we, we can do <laughs> evening. I don't have a problem with that out. either. Because uh, I'm not with Commissioner uh, Graves gone, I'm not sure if that fits her schedule either. I'm, you know, I'm just trying to involve yeah. everybody at this point. Mm -hmm. So if we could reach out, I mean, certainly we have a little bit of time before we have to answer that question um, to get that information out. So and we, we can do an evening meeting. I don't okay. have a problem Let's, doing that either. If we could reach out to all the commissioners and try to get a, a, a consensus of a time. Um, to set up next Wednesday's meeting, we I, I, and I'm I will speak for Emily. We we certainly appreciate the the, the commission's uh, uh, ability and willingness to to move the time. So, other than that, uh, is there anything else to come before the the commission tonight? And we'll adjourn.